go live, gosh. Ah. Usually it auto starts. No problem. Okay. So if everyone can hear me, just press one for if the sound is good. All good. Yes, sir. Awesome. Cool. Thanks again for being here, guys. And here I go, kicking it over to you, David, for someone to do that cold open. <clears throat> Three, two, one, ready, set. Hey, everybody. Today we're debating whether or not Islam requires the violent persecution of Christians. And we are starting right now with David Wood's opening statement. Thanks so much for being with us. The floor is all yours, David. Thank you, James, and thank you, Daniel, for suggesting this topic. Does Islam require the violent persecution of Christians? I have no idea why Daniel wanted to debate this topic. I assume he's got some brilliant argument up his sleeve. And I must be totally deranged for agreeing to debate Daniel when he's got some brilliant argument that's about to destroy me and end my career. But I really want to know what the argument is, so I guess I'll have to debate to find out. Now, I'm obviously not going to argue that Islam requires the violent persecution of Christians in every situation. It doesn't. If the Muslim community is too weak to violently subjugate non-Muslims, then it's the wrong time to violently subjugate Christians. And if Christians have already been subjugated and have become dimmies and they've agreed to certain terms and they're paying jizya, there's no need to violently persecute them. There are plenty of teachings in the Muslim sources that seem to call for the ongoing degradation and humiliation of Christians even after they have become dhimmis. But there are other teachings which, uh, Muslim, in which Muslims are told to honor their agreements with dhimmis. So I'll, I'll grant for the sake of argument that there's no requirement to violently persecute dhimmis. So what does that leave us with? Well, there are lots of Christians in the world who aren't dimmies. There are lots of Christians who don't ever want to become dimmies. Like me, you can saw my head off. I ain't giving you dime one, Daniel. Are Muslims supposed to live in a state of perpetual peace and harmony with non-Muslims? Not according to Muhammad. And this brings us to our first problem, Islam's emphasis on jihad and martyrdom. Islam programs people to want to fight non-Muslims. In Sahih Muslim 33, Muhammad declares, I've been commanded to fight against people till they testify that there is no God but Allah, that Muhammad is the messenger of Allah, and they establish prayer and pay zakat. And if they do it, their blood and property are guaranteed protection on my behalf, except when justified by law, and their affairs rest with Allah. Fighting is such an essential part of Islam <clears throat> that Muhammad says in Sunan An-Nasai 3099, whoever dies without having fought or having thought of fighting, he dies on one of the branches of hypocrisy. According to Muhammad, you're a hypocrite if you don't fight or in situations where the Muslim community is weak, you don't at least wish you could fight. The emphasis on fighting unbelievers combined with promises of virgins in paradise led to an obsession with jihad and martyrdom in Islam. In Sahih al-Bukhari 2797, Muhammad says, By him in whose hands my soul is, I would love to be martyred in Allah's cause and then come back to life and then get martyred and then come back to life again and then get martyred and then come back to life again and then get martyred. Being martyred while waging jihad gets you lots of stuff in paradise, gets you lots of virgins in paradise. So if you want to spend eternity deflowering virgins, you'll want to be martyred as much as possible. Why is this relevant here? Well, there are approximately 2 billion Christians in the world, and Muhammad made a religion that calls for the violent subjugation of the entire world, and that presents jihad against unbelievers as your golden ticket to the virgin factory. Does Islam require the violent subjugation, the violent uh, persecution of Christians. Of course it does. You're not going to subjugate the world and make Christians pay jizya by getting together and eating falafel at an interfaith picnic. You have to fight. The second problem for Daniel is that the Quran requires the violent persecution of Christians. The Quran does. We're all familiar with Surah 9 verse 29, which commands Muslims to fight Christians until Christians pay the jizya. 
that would actually be enough to prove my point. But when we read the verse in context, it removes all doubt. The passage begins at verse 28 of Surah 9 and goes through verse 33. Let's read the entire passage so we can see how Allah requires the violent persecution of Christians. Verse 28, O you who believe, truly the pagans are unclean, so let them not, after this year of theirs, approach the sacred mosque. And if you fear poverty, soon will Allah enrich you, if he wills, out of his bounty, for Allah is all-knowing, all-wise. So Allah tells Muslims not to let the pagans anywhere near the mosque in Mecca. Some of the Muslims were worried that this would hurt their trade deals with the pagans, so it would hurt them financially. But Allah says he can enrich them to make up for any losses. How is Allah going to enrich them? Next verse. Fight those who believe not in Allah, nor the last day, nor hold that forbidden, which hath been forbidden by Allah and his messenger, nor acknowledge the religion of truth from among the people of the book, Jews and Christians, until they pay the jizya with willing submission and feel themselves subdued. So Allah is going to enrich Muslims by having Muslims fight Jews and Christians until Jews and Christians pay the jizya, tribute money, to acknowledge their inferiority. But why fight Jews and Christians? Aren't we the people of the book? Aren't we believers too? Next verse. And the Jews say, Ezra is the son of Allah. And the Christians say, the Messiah is the son of Allah. These are the words of their mouths. They imitate the saying of those who disbelieved before, Allah's curse be upon them, how they are turned away. So, contrary to what Allah says about Jews and Christians in other parts of the Quran, it turns out that we aren't real monotheists. When Muhammad needed to fight us to make money, we became mushriks. Jews call Ezra the son of God. They don't, by the way. And Christians call Jesus the son of God. Allah got that right, at least. This is the justification for fighting us. Notice that Already, if Allah commands Muslims to fight Christians because of our beliefs, does Islam require the violent persecution of Christians? Sure sounds like it. But have we done anything else? Next verse, 931. They took their rabbis and their monks to be their lords besides Allah and Christ the son of Mary. Yet they were commanded to worship but one God. There is no God but he. Praise and glory to him. Far is he from having the partners they associate with him. So now Allah says that Jews and Christians take rabbis and monks as lords besides God. We don't, by the way. And he goes on to say that he's far from having the partners we associate with him. So we associate partners with Allah. That makes us mushriks. Any other reason to fight us? Next verse. They desire to put out the light of Allah with their mouths. Notice. It says, with their mouths, not by the sword. This is referring to what we say. But Allah will not allow, but that his light should be perfected, even though the unbelievers may detest it. Allah won't allow Jews and Christians to spread our false beliefs through preaching. But how is Allah going to stop us? Next verse, 33. It is he who hath sent his messenger, Muhammad, with guidance and the religion of truth, Islam, to prevail it over all religion, even though the idolaters may detest it. How is Islam going to prevail? We already read it, Surah 9, verse 29. Fight those who believe not in Allah until they pay the jizya with willing submission and feel themselves subdued. Now, that's the entire passage. Every criterion for fighting Christians in this passage has to do with our religious beliefs and practices. So if Allah commands Muslims to fight Christians because of our beliefs and practices, does Islam require the violent persecution of Christians? Sure sounds like it. Perhaps Daniel will say that Christians can avoid the violence by becoming dhimmis, but that won't work. Allah demands our silence on a specific issue. We're not allowed to say that Jesus is the Son of God. But the identity of Jesus is part of the gospel. And we know from the book of Acts that even though Christians were happy generally to follow the local laws laid down by various authorities, if the authorities ordered them not to preach the gospel, they responded, we must obey God, not man. So the Quran commands Muslims to fight Christians until we stop saying that Jesus is the Son of God, 
but we can't stop saying that Jesus is the Son of God. If Allah orders Muslims to fight Christians until we stop doing something that we're not allowed to stop doing, then the Quran requires the violent persecution of Christians. Third problem for Daniel, Muhammad ordered his followers to execute apostates, and we're at the beginning of an avalanche of apostasy. Muslim apologists like Zakir Naik and Ahmed Didat spent decades lying to their followers. Now, now Muslims are realizing that their apologists lied to them about Muhammad and the Quran, and they're leaving Islam like it's a sport. When Muslims leave Islam, they usually become either Christians or atheists. Muhammad ordered his followers to kill them. So when Muslims today realize that Muhammad is the most obvious false prophet in history, when they realize that they can't take the ramblings of an illiterate 7th century Arabian caravan robber seriously, many of them become Christians and many of them become atheists. Muhammad said to kill them. If a Muslim leaves Islam and becomes a Christian, what does Islam require? Islam requires that he be executed if he refuses to return to Islam. Is killing people because they've converted to Christianity violent persecution? Absolutely. So does Islam require the violent persecution of Christians? Indisputably. Putting all of this together, Islam calls for the violent subjugation of the world and produces an obsession with martyrdom. This leads to the violent persecution of Christians. The Quran commands Muslims to fight Christians until we pay the jizya and stop saying that Jesus is the Son of God. This obviously requires the violent persecution of Christians. And Islam says that when Muslims convert to Christianity, they have to be killed for converting. That's violent persecution. But as I acknowledged at the beginning of my opening statement, if the Muslim community is too weak to subjugate non-Muslims, then it's just not the right time to violently persecute Christians. So the most obvious path to peace available to us is for the Muslim community to never outnumber or be stronger than the non-Muslim community. This means that we can establish peace by making more ex-Muslims. We can establish peace through the avalanche of apostasy. If the avalanche of apostasy is the path to peace, if the avalanche of apostasy is the way to avoid the violent persecution of Christians, sign me up. I'd be happy to help you with that one, Daniel. Thank you very much for that opening statement from David. And I want to let you know, folks, if it's your first time here at Modern Day Debate, we are a neutral platform hosting debates on science, religion, and politics. We hope you feel welcome no matter what walk of life you are from. And don't forget to hit that subscribe button as we have many more juicy debates coming up in the future. With that, we're going to kick it over to Daniel for his 12-minute opening as well. Thanks for being with us, Daniel. The floor is all yours. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, salatu wa salam ala rasulillah. Thank you, James and David. Let's get to the heart of the matter here. David says that Islam endorses continuous violent jihad against Christians until they convert or pay jizya. And once Christians are living under an Islamic state, they're constantly discriminated against. And according to David, that is persecution. Let me make this easy for you, David. Guilty as charged. Islam is expansionist. It does require expansionist jihad. And when Islam is in power, it does discriminate against non-Muslims. Guilty as charged. But guess what, David? Every political system requires war and discrimination. There never has been and there never will be a political system that says we should not use violence to gain power and resources. There never has been, an, has been and there never will be a political system that says all beliefs and ways of life should be respected equally. There is no such political system. So why are you judging Islam according to these impossible standards? Let me explain. Imagine a world in which there is no violence, no war, and you can have a political system where every religion and ideology is equal, and there's no discrimination against any group. Sounds good, right? Well, it doesn't matter because this is an impossible world. No such world has ever existed. If such a world could exist, David's criticism of Islam might make sense. In the real world, however, David's criticism of Islam makes absolutely no sense because offensive wars and inequality necessarily exist. This is for the simple reason that groups are always engaged in violent struggle for power and resources. That has literally been the history of the world since the beginning of the human race. 
So Christian apologists focus on these two issues, expansionist war and then the whole inequality slash thimmy issue. First, let's talk about expansionist war. David wants to blame Islam for having expansionist war, but guess what? Every group, once it has power, engages in expansionist war. Literally every single group, past, present, and future. We have to have a realistic view of the world. In reality, relationships between nations are based on power, and nations are constantly competing for power and resources. The Muslim stance toward any other nation will depend on power. So where Muslims don't have power, they can pursue a political strategy of qualified peace and reconciliation with other groups, or even a situation where non-Muslims are privileged over Muslims. This was actually the case with the early Muslim community, not only in Mecca, but also with the Treaty of Hudaybiyah. When the Muslim nation does have more power, then it will pursue a strategy of spreading Islam through military conquest and privileging the interests of Muslims. Sounds terrible to the liberalized ear. How could you spread religion by force? But this is not just what Muslims do. All groups pursue this kind of two-tiered strategy. The difference is Muslims are honest about this strategy, whereas other groups are not. For example, America spins this beautiful picture about how it believes all countries in the world have equal rights and sovereignty. But the reality is American foreign policy is always aiming to create a world order that is under the control of American power and serving American interests. And this is pursued through all manner of coercion, war, violence. What would make America stop doing this? Nothing. Only if America loses power and is forced to stop by another more powerful nation. The same exact thing is the case with Russia, China, India, Israel, literally every nation. If you don't have power, try to forge peace and reconciliation. If you are in power, violently expand. Historically, Christian nations have literally followed this same exact policy. Jews have followed this exact policy. Hindus have literally always followed this same policy. Hindus are this nice little peaceful group when they live as minorities. But once they get a little taste of political power, like in modern India, they start bulldozing mosques and lynching beef eaters. So Islam has the same view that literally all other nations have, including Christian nations in the past. Now some Christians might say, no, we don't believe in a Christian state that seeks to violently subjugate the world to Christian norms and advance Christian interests. Now isn't it convenient that Christians take this line of peace and reconciliation in modern times now that they aren't in power? This is the pattern with Christians. When Christians were a weak minority under Roman rule in the first three centuries, they talked a lot about mi minority rights and how there should be limits on Roman control. But as soon as Christians come into power with Constantine, they're all about crusading and subjugating the pagans and the heretics. And then when they're disempowered again in the modern world vis-a-vis -vis, vis -vis secularism, then once again, they take this passivist stance. That's fine, I'm not faulting Christians for their pragmatism, but the difference between Muslims and Christians is that Muslims are honest about this reality, while Christians keep reinterpreting the Bible to pretend like their religion is all about peace and religious freedom. Okay, so that's the answer to expansionist jihad. Now let's talk about dhimmis. One of the main assumptions that Christian apologists like David embed in their arguments against Islam is that there is potentially a system of government where every belief and way of life is treated equally and everyone lives in peace and it's just these intolerant Muslims who are trying to spoil the party. This depiction of Muslims is only effective because it's premised on this theoretical system of government. But the reality is such a system of government is an impossible fantasy. Now a Christian might respond, well, what about modern secular states where everyone enjoys religious freedom and all beliefs are treated equally? The response to that is, first of all, traditional Christianity and the Bible do not endorse secularism. And second of all, in these secular states which, which claim to treat all people equally, what they really do is privilege secular beliefs and a secular way of life while Christians, Muslims, and all other religious groups are marginalized. When Christians, for example, try to preach their values in these secular societies, it's called hate speech. 
When Christians try to implement their values through the legal system, it's called a violation of separation of church and state. When Christians try to teach their values to their children, the state only allows a secular scientific worldview to be taught in public schools. This is not an equal system. This is a system that privileges secular liberal atheism. In this secular system, Christians, Muslims, and other religious groups are just marginalized dhimmis. When David attacks Islam by supporting this fake idea of political equality for all religions, what he's really doing is legitimating a secular system where Christians are second-class citizens that are being wiped out. In other words, David has no problem with Christians being dhimmis. He just wants them to be dhimmis under liberal atheists, not Muslims. In this debate, David Wood should just concede that there is no such thing as political neutrality where all beliefs and ways of life are respected equally. He should just admit that. Then his whole argument falls apart. Because if Islam is bad because it doesn't give every minority group equal status, then all other religions and ideologies are bad too. David's criticism against Islam only makes sense if we were to assume that it's possible to have this neutral political system that privileges everyone equally. But such a system is impossible. The thing about Islam is that it is honest. Islam acknowledges that all systems are discriminatory and Islam is the best and most objectively just system of government given that reality. Meanwhile, Christians and liberals are living in this fantasy world. Look, Christians only have two options. Do you prefer a world where Christians are dominant or do you prefer a world where Christians are being dominated? Those are the only two options. So if David's whole criticism is that the Islamic system is discriminatory against Christians, yeah, of course, I concede that. But so is every other system. Every system that is not a Christian dominated system is going to discriminate against Christians. So what is really the criticism here? Is David blaming Islam because it does not establish a Christian dominated political theocracy? No, that would be silly. His actual argument is that Islam persecutes Christians because Islam is not secular liberalism. But guess what? Muslims don't want a secular liberal system because Muslims don't want to be second class citizens dominated by secular atheists. Obviously, Islam is going to have a political system that privileges Muslims and Islam. Again, when Christians like David demand Islam to be more like secularism, they're basically saying, we don't want to be second class citizens to Muslims, we want to be second class citizens to secular atheists. In other words, David is perfectly okay with discrimination against Christians. He just wants to make sure it's liberal seculars doing it as opposed to Muslims. To summarize, yes, Islam does discriminate against Christians, but so does every other non-Christian political system. But honestly, this discrimination in Islam is not really that bad because unlike every other non-Christian political system, Muslims genuinely respect Christians and genuinely share key Christian values. And Christians are much more likely to persist and preserve their religion under Islamic law than under any other system precisely because of these shared values. Christians, for example, want a life that's organized around God and serving him. Islamic law fully allows Christians to establish this for their communities. But secular liberalism has been in constant war against God. Christians want to get married and raise their families according to the Bible. Islamic law allows Christians to do this, but secular liberal liberalism has all but destroyed Christian marriage and family. Christians want to transmit biblical values to their children through education. Islamic law fully allows Christians to do this, but secular liberalism says to keep God, to keep God and the Bible out of the classroom. Christians want to create Christian businesses, Islamic law fully allows Christians to do this, but secular liberalism says no, you have to bake the rainbow cakes whether you like it or not. So that's really the crux of the debate. Law, Islamic law says to Christians, your lives are safe, your families are safe, your property is safe, your churches are safe. You can live by your own religious laws in your homes, your schools, your work, workplaces, but just don't try to convert Muslims, don't openly blaspheme against Islam, and pay an annual tax. Is this really the humiliation and subjugation of Christians that David is talking about? In reality, the most humiliated and subjugated Christians have ever been is under secularism. So Christians should ask David, what is it really that you're trying to promote here? Is it Christianity or is it secular liberal atheism? Thank you very much for that opening as well.
with that, we're going to jump into the rebuttals and want to let you know, folks, if you enjoy debates like these and you have friends who enjoy debates like these, hit that share button and share this debate with them. That share button is just below. And with that, thanks so much, David. The floor is all yours for your seven minute rebuttal. Thank you, Daniel. And uh, this has officially been the easiest debate in history <laughs> because it looks like we agree. The topic is, does Islam require the violent persecution of Christians? It seems like Daniel is saying, yes, absolutely, but everyone's doing it. Well, great. That's kind of irrelevant if everyone's doing it. The question is whether Islam does it. That's the topic of our debate. Um, so let, let's, let's go and see where we're at. Uh, in my opening statement, I pointed out three ways that Islam requires the violent persecution of Christians. One, Islam places so much emphasis on jihad and martyrdom that the violent persecution of Christians is inevitable. Two, Allah claims in Surah 9, verses 28 to 33, that he sent Muhammad to fight Christians and force Christians to pay jizya in order to silence Christians and keep us from saying that Jesus is Lord. You're obviously not going to silence billions of Christians without some serious violent persecution. Three, Muhammad clearly commanded his followers to kill apostates. So when Muslims leave Islam because they, they see through the lies and they become Christians, what happens? Islam says, kill them. That by definition is violent persecution. So I laid out multiple ways that Islam does indeed require the violent persecution of Christians. How did Daniel respond? He didn't say anything that would address any of these points, except maybe thinking that that uh, dimitude isn't as bad as, as we might think, but we can always go into that a little further. Um, instead, he argued first that uh, he says that he grants that Islam is expansionistic and that it discriminates against non-Muslims. No, no disagreement between us there, but as soon as he said that, the debate was over. This debate was over. We could have another debate on another topic, but on the actual topic of this debate, we agree. The answer is yes, Islam does require this. He says that other political systems do the same thing. Um, be interesting to look at debates, and I know Daniel's had debates on, on that before, but it's irrelevant. Every political system in the universe could call for the violent subjugation, um, violent persecution against Christians. That wouldn't change the fact that Islam does. So the question before us is whether Islam calls for the violent persecution of Christians, and we agree on that. Second, he admits that Islam eventually wants offensive jihad. So if Islam is eventually going to uh, go around, uh, as, as a, uh, uh, Sheikh Asim al-Hakim says, that uh, Muslims will eventually go door to door and, and offer the options. You either convert to Islam uh, or you pay the jizya or those are the options that are going to be given to Christians when Christians are, I mean, when Muslims are powerful enough to go around doing that. So obviously that's not a situation we want to be in. What's Daniel's response? He says, well, other ideologies do it too. That's great, but not relevant to our topic. Whether, whether every other ideology in the world is uh, more peaceful than Islam or whether every other ideology in the world is even worse against Christians than Islam is not relevant. The question is, does Islam require violent persecution of Christians? Um, third, he says, well, Christians follow the same pattern. This would also be irrelevant to the, to the topic. Um, but this is one thing I'll grant is this is a thing that humans do when any group of people get in a position of power, they try to maintain that power. That's a human thing. The difference is that's not built into our religion. That's not what the apostles commanded Christians to do. That's not what Jesus commanded us to do, to go out and violently subjugate the world or to uh, strive after political power wherever we can uh, find it. Um, later Christians did that. That's not built into our religion. It is built into Islam. It's built into Islam to subjugate everyone else and everyone else has to be under the authority of Islam. But with that said, completely irrelevant, completely irrelevant. We could grant for the sake of argument that, that what, that, that, that Christianity somehow calls for the violent subjugation of the entire world. What does that have to do with the topic? Does Islam require the violent persecution of Christians? We agree on that. Fifth, he says that uh, Christians are much more likely to preserve their religion and their values under Islam. Well, that's that's just ridiculous. Um, there's no requirement. There's no requirement right here in, in, let's say, the United States. There's no requirement that I'm not allowed to say 
that Jesus is Lord, that I'm not allowed to go preaching the gospel. There's no, there's no law here that says I can't go preach the gospel and that someone can't believe the gospel and uh, leave their religion and become a Christian. There's nothing stopping. There's nothing stopping us here. Daniel, we're, we're sitting here having a debate on this topic. Um, we couldn't have this. This couldn't be conducted in the same way in a in a Muslim country that is officially following the teachings of Islam because of some of the things I've said already that would be a death sentence. So um, the idea that Islam will somehow preserve uh, Christian values better than secular liberalism, secular liberalism sort of leaves it to us to preserve it if we want to. And so it, that, that task falls to Christians to go ahead and do that. In Islam, it's, hey, you're a dimmy now, pay us money and uh whatever you do you don't get to go around preaching the gospel you don't get to go around criticizing islam you don't get to go around doing any of these things and so you, you can just look at the impact that's had that, that that's had in the middle east there used to be christian majorities christian majority nations now you look at the the number of christians in that population and you end up with you know four or five percent population uh christians in in certain places and so what happened there well how did islam preserve that religion for them. How did Islam help that? Well, you didn't. You you treated them as second class citizens and treated them horribly and persecuted them. And over a period of centuries, this sort of thing has an impact. Now, Daniel may, may say, well, secularism is going to do the same thing. Uh, that may be the case. Absolutely irrelevant. Uh, we're, I, I'm not obsessed with controlling the world. I'm not told in my religion, we're going to go out and, and subjugate the world. We're told we're going to be persecuted, that everyone's going to hate us, and that we're going to be on the receiving end of persecution, not, the, not that we're going to go out and become the persecutors. You have Christians who say, no, well, in order to avoid that, we have to go and become the persecutors. Um, but in, in Christianity, we're told we're going to be the persecuted. So finding out that one day we may no longer be the world's top religion or something like that, it's not, it's not upsetting to us. In Islam, if you find out that you're not going to be able to subjugate the entire world, we got a problem because that's what Muhammad said you're going to do. You got to thank you very much for that rebuttal, David Wood. And we're going to kick it over to Daniel as well for his rebuttal, which is seven minutes as well. And I want to remind you folks, if you haven't yet, hit that like button. And Daniel, thanks so much. The floor is all yours. All right, David. Um, so just to respond uh, to your points, um, this is one thing that I wanted to ask you. When have Christians in history ever not sought to dominate Muslims? as soon as they have the opportunity to do so. When? You know, name one time in history where Christians had power and they did not seek to dominate Muslims. You won't be able to find one example of that. And that's very significant because Muslim rules with engaging or Islamic rules for engaging Christians are going to de depend on Christian actions. And if Christians as long as Islam has existed from, from the time of the Prophet, peace be upon him, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Christians have been trying to dominate Muslims, then that is going to shape what Islamic policies are. So wherever you see this kind of domination or you see this kind of reaction from Muslims, it's not like Christians are these little lambs that have been uh, you know, sitting peacefully in Europe or in you know, the Roman Empire or the Byzant Byzantine Empire rather, and they haven't had any kind of belligerence. No, they're actively cr uh, crusading. They're actively attacking Muslims. They're actively expanding. Now, you may say that this has nothing to do with Christianity, but Muslims can't bank on what you know, your interpret David Wood's peaceful pacifist interpretation of Christianity. Muslims have to deal with the real world. And in the real world throughout history, Christians have been extremely belligerent, extremely expansionist. So that's what Islam is actually addressing. So another thing that you mentioned is this avalanche of apostasy that supposedly Muslims are going through. Where is the evidence for that? I recently just posted uh, stats, you know, official objective stats on, from Pew on who is actually experiencing a, an apostasy of uh, an avalanche of apostasy. It's Christians. It's Christians. And why do you think that is, David? I mean, this is something that we should address. The reason is liberal secularism. This is what is causing the avalanche of apostasy 
for Christians. Muslims are actually gaining numbers in terms of religious switching. So you can put out all of these, you know, stupid videos with quoting, you know, what you call Dawagandists saying things about, oh, we have to worry about apostasy of our youth. That's all you have are sound bites and clips taken out of context. Context. Let's look at the actual statistics about who is experiencing an avalanche of apostasy. You say Daniel concedes the debate. And that's false. I, didn't, I have not conceded the debate. Okay? The, the debate topic is that Islam endorses violent persecution. And implicit in this claim or tacit to this claim is that Islam supports measures which are not inevitable. But I just explained to you uh, in, very clear, in a very clear way that this kind of violence that you're criticizing Islam for is actually inevitable. And you acknowledge that. You said this is human nature. And, and so again, I'll ask you, do you concede that, every, that any existing system counts as violent persecution? If you, if you concede that, then it does take the whole wind out of your argument against Islam. You're singling out Islam as a system of violent persecution because you're, the implication of that is that this is not the same for all systems. You should make that explicit. You should concede, concede that, yes, there's violent persecution in all systems, all political systems, including the secular liberal one. The, the term violent persecution implies injustice. It implies something that is... Uh, contrary to human decency. So that's the, that's the definition that I'm, or the uh, connotation of the word that I'm operating under with this debate topic. So I do not concede that there's violent persecution. I concede that there's discrimination, but discrimination is inevitable. Okay, um, you claim again that violent expansion is not built into our religion. Yes, it is. <laughs> violent expansion is not built into Christianity in the sense that you want it to mean, in the sense of, oh, well, right now, today, me, David Wood, I'm not going to go and start hacking people, as you put it. Rather, when I say that violent expansion is built into your religion, what I mean is that it is something that is morally acceptable according to Christianity. And in our last debate, you conceded this. You actually conceded and said that, well, if God commands you to go and murder uh, or, or kill uh, men, women, children, infants, and bash their heads on stones, if God commands it, then it's fine. There's no moral problem with that. So it means that according to your God, that is something morally acceptable to do. So you should really concede that. It is built into your religion, even though right now you might not ha God might not be telling you to go and violently expand, but it's still a part of what God has commanded others to say, other believers to say in history, according to the Bible. You say that Middle East used to be Christian, um, majority uh, Christian. Okay, fine. Uh, yes, I agree that the policies of Islam have led to Christians converting uh, to Islam over the course of 1400 years. But look at what secularism has done to Christians. It's Europe also used to be a majority Christian, hardcore Christian. Look at it now. Europe is the graveyard of Christianity. What has caused that, David? It, if that, what has caused that is violent persecution, is real violent persecution and, and death and, and genocide. That, that's the, what you need to recognize. And it's Muslim, uh, Christians who have done it, Christians who have secularized, liberal atheists who have done it, but you have no criticism for, for those kinds of people. You also mentioned like a contradiction or a supposed contradiction in the Quran that the Quran is saying, uh, mentioning Jews and Christians on the one hand and then the Mushrikeen on, on the other hand. This is just an ignorance of Islamic theology. Um, mushrikeen, kuffar is the, the non-believers, kuffar is the larger category. And under that larger category, there are different kinds of non-believers. There are mushrikeen. That's another big umbrella. It's like a subcategory. And then mushrikeen have subcategories. So some are people of the book, Ahlul Kitab, are also considered mushrikeen, are also considered um, those who associate partners with God. And they're also non-believers because they reject the final messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, peace be upon him. So that's, that's the definition of mushrikeen. There's no contradiction there. Thank you very much for that rebuttal as well. And we're gonna jump into open conversation, folks. If you happen to have a question, feel free to fire it into the old live chat. If you tag me with at Modern Day Debate, that's one way to submit a question or super chat 
those get pushed to the top of the list. With that, thanks so much, gentlemen. The floor is all yours. And one last reminder, our guests are linked in the description, folks. If you haven't checked out those links, you certainly can right now. Thanks, Daniel and David. The floor is all yours. Uh, yeah, I, I, I only I only uh, detected I only detected one thing you said in your entire rebuttal um, or really in your entire opening statement combined with your rebuttal that would actually uh, be the negative position on the actual topic. So I only detected one thing that is actually relevant to our topic, and that is your claim that you didn't you didn't concede that Islam requires the violent persecution of Christians because you said violent persecution would require injustice and you don't view it as injustice and therefore uh, therefore it's not violent persecution. So um, killing apostates, violently subjugating people because of their religious beliefs and practices, uh, saying that I have to subjugate this group because they say that Jesus is Lord and force them to pay me money um, that, that I have to go eventually, if I get into a position where I'm strong enough, that I would go door to door and knock on the door and say, hey, uh, you either have to convert to Islam or you pay the jizya or, uh, and the idea that that's not violent persecution because you're just going to say it's not, it's not injustice. Well, notice any, any group that oppresses any group could say, well, we don't view it as injustice. So China right now with the Uyghurs could say that this genocide against the Uyghurs, we, it's not persecution. It's not, it's not violent persecution because we view it as perfectly fine and just. We view it as preserving our society. And so just, just changing the name of a term doesn't actually change what it is. Following this reasoning, you could go in and drink alcohol and say, well, I'm not drinking alcohol, I'm drinking beer. I'm not drinking alcohol, I'm drinking champagne. See, I'm calling it by a different name, therefore it changes what it is. So it, it looks to me like if, we're, if, we're, if we were to agree on what it means to violently persecute people and say, well, it's not what your personal preferences about what happens to be injustice, uh, then it looks like everything else we agree on that Islam does call for the violent persecution of Christians. No, like in, even in the example of um, like a Muslim nation, an Islamic nation or Khilafa, the Caliphate, there's not necessarily this requirement to constantly be at war with Christians. There can be peace agreements that are formed. And this is clear in the example of the prophet, peace be upon him. This is clear in the uh, caliphs, the righteous caliphs, um, in their example. And throughout Muslim history, Muslims have formed uh, pacts and agreed, uh, treaties, agreements with Christian nations and other nations. That is always on the table for the caliph or the emir to decide that, look, we're going to have this kind of agreement, but it's a qualified agreement. It's not, we'll never have any conflict with Christians ever, or we'll never, uh, we'll promise never in the future in a thousand years not to invade Christian land. There's no agreement like that allowed in Islam, but for periods of time, for a generation, two generations, you can have that kind of uh, peace agreement. And this is de demonstrated by the prophet, peace be upon him. Now, uh, let, let me let me just ask for a, for a clarification because I don't actually know your position. This is this is this has been my understanding of that of that whole process, uh, because uh, and and this is based on trying to make sense of you know the progression we see in the Quran and the you know the Hadith and the Tafsir as well as uh, what what various Muslim scholars have said. But my understanding has been that uh, everything is based on the pattern of Muhammad when Muhammad is the the persecuted prophet in in Mecca. He preaches a message of you know, let's let's not kill each other. Let's not persecute each other here. Um, and then later on, he formed alliances and uh, had had a larger number of followers around him. Then the message changed to one of defensive jihad. You can fight now, uh, or or actually required, eventually required to fight in self defense of the community. So if someone is attacking the community in various ways, then you would uh, fight back and Muslims should unite and fight back. And then eventually you have offensive jihad. Once Muslims were powerful enough to subjugate Arabia, then they subjugated Arabia. So I've always regarded what you were just saying 
about forming peace agreements, and you said that they're temporary. I have viewed peace agreements as temporary uh, in the same way that Sheikh Asim al-Hakim views them. He says, yes, right now, when we're not powerful enough to go out and wage offensive jihad and fight and subjugate and, and force people into those three options, right now we should focus on you know, increasing our faith and building up our community until we get to the point where we're strong enough. So I, I'm not disagreeing with you that Islam allows uh, you know, treaties and peace agreements in various situations and so on. But as you pointed out, that seems to be temporary and the goal doesn't seem to be peace. The goal seems to be, hey, we're not strong enough to fight right now. So it's in the best interest of the Muslim community if we agree to peace with these people who, as of right now, are too powerful for us to subjugate. But eventually we get strong enough. Once we get strong enough, then we're going to have to go and fight them. That's the pattern that, that I see in the Muslim sources. And I know there are Muslims who've, oh, I just, uh, I who would agree with it. me. But yeah, what, what's your, that, that's your view? I, can, I mentioned the two-tier strategy in my opening. And I mentioned how this is what, how, what every group has done, including Christians. When they didn't have power, they were about reconciliation and peace in the first three centuries of Christendom. And then as soon as they get power, they are expanding, they're persecuting heretics, they are uh, killing non-believers left and right. This is also the history of Christendom. And it's only because Christians do not have power now that they, are in, uh, that they promote this kind of uh, freedom of religion and equality, free speech. Look, I'll ask you, David, a question. Uh, if you somehow had power over the entire world, okay, or you had become the dominant superpower and your nation had this weapon, this futuristic weapon that could subjugate everyone throughout the world, okay, with the click of a button, even more advanced than nuclear warheads, you somehow have this technology as a Christian. Would you use that technology to actually create supremacy for Christendom, to make the word of Jesus Christ all high in the world? Would you institute policies that privileged Christians and that actually privileged the word of Jesus Christ? Is this something that you would pursue as king of the world? Um, I would... I would, uh, I would implement policies that I believe are fair to everyone. I, I don't believe in making people believe. If, if you convert because I'm going to persecute you or something like that, or I'm going to make you, uh, make you convert, I, I kind of don't regard it as. I as, didn't say make, as, I didn't say sincere. make people convert. I didn't say make people convert. I just say yeah. policies that privilege Christians, privilege Christianity. You, you're not forcing anyone to convert. Um, the, you're, the, you're giving an you're giving an the incentive. Policies, the policies that I that I would think of as uh, being beneficial to Christians would would be beneficial to almost everyone, unless it's someone who wants who wants to go out and, and subjugate and, and persecute other people and so on. So, so, that, so you would you would institute policies that are preferential to Christian them. You just think that Christianity is the best for everyone. No, I'm saying policies policies that I would regard as the best for Christianity would also be the best for everyone else who who isn't trying to subjugate the world. Let, let, let me let me just give you let me just give you an example, right? So you take uh, you take the the time of the apostles when the apostles are going out and preaching and so on. There was a time when uh, there was a conspiracy to murder the apostle Paul. So his enemies in Israel. Uh, wanted to get him from the Romans, wanted to get him from the Romans to a Jewish trial because they were planning to execute him. They were planning to, to murder him along the way. And the Apostle Paul tells the Romans, tells the Romans, hey, uh, the, the, there's a plot to kill me here. Don't let them do it. And the Romans actually use their, their army to get him to safety. Then he's having a trial and it's clear that, uh, that uh, people are coming after him based on certain claims that he's made and so on, that Jesus is Lord. And he says, I appeal to Caesar. He says, I appeal to Caesar. Who's Caesar? Caesar is a total pagan. But the apostle Paul was totally happy saying, um, hey, I I'm a Roman citizen here and I have certain rights and those rights are benefit to me. Namely, people can't just randomly kill me over things. The government will protect me. So that's that's a situation where what was best for the apostle Paul didn't need the 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 Roman uh, emperor 
to be a Christian and to enforce Christianity on people. Paul wanted the freedom to go around preaching the gospel and not to be interfered with. And so I, I'm fine with that. Like the apostle, I'm fine with that. I'm fine How's, if government says I'm not going to interfere. This is irrelevant to the well, example well, you're, well, that I gave. Well, the things you're saying, is, in, in my example, things you're saying are irrelevant to the entire debate. No, Go. it's not because I'm you're you're complaining about Islam wanting to have this kind of Islamic law implemented across the entire globe. I'm and I'm giving you the exact I'm, I'm giving you the exact same scenario. I'm saying um, would if somehow Christianity was dominant and you could privilege Christianity through policies that would, you know, basically through force of law, privilege Christian belief, incentivize conversion to Christianity, uh, even punish blasphemy, let's say, but you can strike that if you don't want it. There's still law and order. You're not forcing anyone to convert, but you're just ha establishing a system where Christianity is uh, privileged. And you said, you said right now that, yes, you would want that kind of system Did because not. Christianity is the best so you no. want a system, you want a system like you're the you're the king, but you uh -huh. want you would have like a Muslim vice president or vice king and your administration would have Hindus and Buddhists and and Muslims because it's freedom and equality for all. Right. According to your system. Right. Let, yes let, me, no? just give, let, let me just give you my view because it might help you understand things. No, I no, believe, just answer the question. Just answer I'm the question. Don't give, I'm, go I'm, on. I'm, you I'm have these very I'm wrong answers, there, David. There, there's a huge you can just say yes or no. Why no, can't you say a, yes or no? There's a huge misunderstanding here. You assume that that political power is good in the sense of if your group can get into political power, then you can implement your policies. I view political power as something that will corrupt people once they have it almost, almost inevitably. So if you take Christians who for three centuries and never crossed their minds to get violent, suddenly you give them a bunch of political power and they've been persecuted for centuries now. It's a it's a pretty natural inclination to say, all right, now we have to now we have to stop and never be in that situation again. So let's go out and, and strive for uh, to maintain this sort of political so, power. So you think that Christians should never have power um, because it, power corrupts. So Christians should never strive to have power. You want to live in a world where Christians are always being dominated by other groups? Not not what I'm saying. Not what I'm saying so at all. I'm there, saying there are two cho choices here, David. Christians are dominant. They have a dominant system that privileges Christianity or Christians are being dominated. Those are the only two options. Logically, I which would, one, which I one do you not, prefer? I would not trust a system where Christians dominate and enforce Christianity. on, on other <laughs> so, people. so you I want atheists, you want atheists to be dominant. I don't trust or any Muslims. of them. That's the point. That's the point. <laughs> that's the point. I don't trust. I don't trust anyone who's going to be implemented, implementing these kinds of policies. That's why if you're going to do anything, the best case scenario would be something that is best for the most people where the government actually says, OK, there are certain things that we're not going to interfere with. If you guys get violent, then, yes, we have to we have to interfere with it. If, if one group is going to subjugate another group, then we have to interfere. So, but apart from that, we're not saying you have to believe this or you have to uh, uh, agree with that religion or you're not allowed to say that religion. Daniel, you're, you're free to walk down the street and preach your religion. I'm, I'm free to no, walk not. down the street and, and no, you're not. preach my religion. You're not free to preach your religion. This is yeah. something else I wanted to respond to. You're not free to preach uh, the Bible. Go to any European secular country. There are hate speech laws. There in Finland, they just put someone in prison for uh, oh, then, sharing then, then, verses. Then, yeah. then, then they would then they would be screwed up. Then that would be messed up if you're if Why? you're punishing people. Why? It's for, hate speech. For hate it's hate. Speech. Speech. Yeah, it's hate speech. No, no. How, how is that? Uh, the notice, secular notice. justification. The because secular justification is that these verses are hateful. You can't teach these verses because I don't. But that's the point. I don't want governments to have that kind of authority over people because inevitably they become they become corrupt and start and start crushing people. So I don't like it from secularists. I don't like it from from Muslims. I don't like it from anyone. No, that's based on that's based on it's, their... it's, it's, very, it's very simple. Don't uh, you know, don't stop what I don't stop me from saying what I want to say unless I'm calling for, you know, violence or something like that. You're saying they're doing it, too. Great. Then I don't like it when they do it. I don't like it when they do it. I don't like it when Muslims do it. If Christians do it, I wouldn't like it when Christians do it. 
and again, nothing to do with the topic right now. Does Islam require? No, it does. It, the all of this has to do with the topic because the topic is religious freedom and religious the, the minorities. Topic is not, the topic is not religious freedom. <laughs> the topic is. Those are the points that you're bringing Islam, up. You're saying does, that your argument was that Islam infringes on the rights of Christians. This Daniel, is a infringement of your religious a, rights. Absolutely. So that's what the topic is. I do want to move maybe into like a new zone of anything that's been brought up in the statement so far once you guys are ready. I know if you have one last thought on that, David. Well, I didn't yeah. have any answer from David on this question. You want Christians to be dominated. So that means you no, want... It's not. No, it's not. I would like a government that does not, that doesn't dominate us, right? So you you're want a secular me, you're, liberal, you want a secular me, liberal you're, government. You're asking me what kind of government I would prefer. It would not be a, a, it would not be any sort of government that is oppressing me or telling me I can't, I can't preach the gospel or, or anything like that. With that said, I'd be fine with a, a king. If he's a good king, I'd be fine with democracy. If it's a, if a, it's a pretty fairly well-informed people who uh, aren't sending uh, sending us into insanity and so on. So I'm fine with all. I'm so, I'm fine with a variety of. Daniel, what what is I, it? I, Tell I me have, what this government I have, is. I have I have no concept of here's the government that I want to impose on the world. And you're saying, David, what what kind of government would you impose? I don't want how to. Can, impose, how can you I criticize? Don't want to no, 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 no. You can't criticize Islam and Islamic governance of and Islamic law if you don't have an alternative. What of is course, the what is the I can. alternative? I can, I, I can what is almost, the alternative? I'm saying say that Islam is the best alternative. Islam is the best alternative, and you're saying no, it's not. Okay, so give me your alternative. Uh, I, I would take clearly almost, it's not a Christian dominated I would, alternative. I would take almost anything except for maybe a, a really diehard communist nation, which I would regard as as comparable to Islam. But the the, the bottom line is, look at I mean, look at the things you're saying. Well, you know, they might classify something you say as. Uh, hate speech, something like that. Um, that that that's not nearly as bad. That's not nearly as bad as things would be for a Christian we, we in we don't a have Muslim to focus, country. We don't have to focus on hate on the topic. Speech. We don't what have to about, focus on the topic. No, no. What about no, no? Rights of Christians as a minority. How about marriage? Look right. at Christian marriage and how it has been disintegrated. How Christian families have been disintegrated over the course. Yeah, how how likely it is for sons. you? To, how Don't likely how likely is it is it for you to get divorced? How likely is it for your children to uh, leave Christianity? How likely is it for you to transmit your values to your children? Very unlikely, increasingly unlikely, uh, more unlikely by the day under a secular system that supposedly is giving you all of this freedom and equality. Christ, like I said, look Not at Europe. Topic. Look at yes, it is. Yes, it is the topic. I do. To be fair, I do want to move back to any of the topics that have been covered so far. This is where you guys would have a chance to address anything that's been brought up in your previous statements, too. Yeah, I am bringing up. I am talking about what is the core of this debate, which is the rights of Christians and persecution and discrimination of Christians. That is the topic of the debate. And I'm saying that Islam, yes, it has discrimination, mm -hmm. but it's actually discrimination that is more favorable to Christians. And there is literally not like, a like, single like killing, alternative. Like kill, like there is literally them. not a single alternative to Islamic law that David can propose that is better for Christians. And that's why you're floundering, David. You can't give me an example. And you uh, even say that, well, I, my job is not to give you an alternative example. Okay, so you can see that there's literally nothing better that you know of to Islamic law. So you can if, just take these cheap shots at Islam without having an alternative. If someone, if someone leaves Islam and converts to Christianity uh, and under Islam, you would execute him. You don't see why I would think that's actually worse than, I mean... Here Do you know are. the history of convert, secularism? Do you I know how convert. many Christians were murdered in the French Revolution the by about? the atheist? Yeah, you don't know what yeah, I'm talking horrible. about. Yeah, great, great. Yeah. I don't that's like a secular that. System. I don't, that's I a secular don't like system. that either. Listen. So let, what's the alternative? Daniel, Daniel, listen, listen, listen to what listen to what you're saying. Does the topic is does Islam require the violent persecution of Christians? There are all sorts of ways we can look at this, uh, calling for the violent subjugation, making them second class citizens, making them pay tribute money, killing apostates, things like that. And your response is, but the 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 French Revolution did it too. It's it's like I mean it, it's <laughs> it's not even the two quote creep because you're not you're not saying I did it. But uh, I mean it's like a kid when you say, hey Johnny, why'd you steal that candy? Well, mom, everyone was doing it, 
Everyone is doing it. If that something, is, if that something is inevitable, if something that is inevitable, fact. my argument is that this kind of discrimination that you're whining about okay, and other apologists, that's something fundamental. No, it's discrimination. That's something that's inherent to any government system. And the then, modern, then the, the modern the secular topic, system discriminates topic, and persecutes Christians much more violently than anything that Islam has done. And the history of sec secularism has been far more violent uh, in, in persecuting Christians than anything that has been done in Islam. And yeah, I think that yeah, your all, audience, most Christian conservatives that I know, most of the Christians... Are from secular, the secular government hey, and atheists. who's trying to ban your channel? Running. Who's trying to ban your channel, by the way? That's Is true. It I don't like that yeah. either. I don't okay, like that that's either. That's secularism. So that's what, if all, like that. what if all Christian channels were being banned? Okay. Is, is I'd this... have a problem with it. But just yeah, of notice, course. Just <laughs> That's, because, no. You're having a problem with it. So this is listen, what listen, the secularism Daniel, 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 entails. Let, let me make this little point. Uh, if, if when they do that, when they start banning channels and so on, in fact, you could, you could go to my Twitter page when they ban Muslim channels. I actually complain and I say, hey, you shouldn't be banning this. What am I doing? I'm saying, hey, uh, you, you, shouldn't be, you shouldn't be taking sides in these kinds of, of religious issues and so on. But notice, suppose I were to complain to them and say, hey, you shouldn't be telling Christians or Muslims and so on what they're going to say. Imagine them saying, well, Muslims would do it too. Muslims would tell you what you can say too. That would be irrelevant think, to me. Do you think that, that would be irrelevant to me complaining to them about what they're doing? We're we're debating do you, do you think, whether do you think Islam Holocaust calls for... deniers. Do you think Holocaust deniers should be banned? I want to see what's your level of free speech absolutism. Do you think like no. Holocaust denial? No, no. I think you should. I think you should expose them. I think you should expose them as stupid. Okay, so. You... so. Yeah, you, no, I'm, I'm not so, an absolute. I'm not an. I'm not. I'm how about not, I'm not, how about a government? How about a government? Okay, policy that says that if you're a Holocaust denier, or let's say you're a member of the KKK, you're a neo-Nazi, you're a racist, you cannot be in uh, certain levels of government. You cannot take public office. You're banned from those positions. Do you agree with that? Um. I, I'd have to think about it. again, Daniel. I'm not. I'm not. So neo Nazis, neo Nazis are okay to take official positions in the government, according to you. Uh, no. I, I mean, what 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 sort of what sort of uh? I, I just want to see I, I, which I, which I, what, beliefs what you, which beliefs do you want to discriminate against? Because you say that you're open to all beliefs. There shouldn't be any policies no, against any no, any belief. What about neo Nazi beliefs? What no, about KKK? KKK? So those so in your My ideal goodness. government, Daniel, in your this ideal is, government, this is such a simple your, topic. This, why are you, this happens. Well, don't this interrupt, happens man. In, don't this interrupt happens me, David. In so many debates. Do this not in so many do debates. not interrupt me, David. Let me finish my thought. Uh, hey, first, you first, are at first. I ain't you are okay. I ain't your dimmy here. But I'll, I'll go ahead and let, I'll go ahead and let you continue. But but the point the, the point is you soon you're, maybe soon. everything you're saying maybe soon, David. Don't don't speak too soon. It's not end of the debate over. We don't know if you're going to be my Vimy or not. But answer the question. So you're fine with, are you fine or are you not fine with having neo-Nazis, KKK members, people with these kinds of beliefs, outright racism? They're not violent. They just espouse this kind of white supremacy. Are you fine with them being in positions of government, public policy, and being able to like preach their, their view, views about white supremacy? I, I think you I think you have some people who aren't terribly far off some of that and especially in Europe you're getting people who That's not aren't an answer. very who aren't very far off from that. You you're approve missing, of that? Do you approve you're, of that you're, or not? No, you're you're oversimplifying it. If you wanted to rule, <laughs> listen, if you wanted to rule people out, you'd have to describe the policies that would be used and show how they would be implemented in order to ensure that certain people with certain views are excluded. And if those policies- Do you think they should would, be excluded? That's the question. If those policies- You're, you're just rambling. You, I'd you're have avoiding to see, the question. Dude, I'd, have to, I'd, have to see the, I'd have to see the- You have to see the because, policy? The policy is neo-Nazis and white supremacists cannot take public positions in government. So the They cannot be public the, school the, teachers. The government they only be, says that. The, the government yeah. only says that, right? Yeah. Just yeah. no neo-Nazis, right? No neo-Nazis. Yeah. Neo-Nazis, no, no KKK. I think it would have to be more general. It would have to be if you if you hold views, if you hold views in the government calling for, uh, you know, the, the racial su superiority of, of one group or something like that, uh, then again, I don't I, I, I don't know how you do this. You'd have to. You, it's not something you just decide and say this group is is magically banned. And again, totally, completely, utterly irrelevant. 
Duh. Yes, it is I relevant. Don't know why it is you're relevant. From the topic. So, okay, Does so Islam neo Nazi. No, 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 no. Don't try to. But what, don't David, try to weasel out of it. Let me give you five thousand hypothetical scenarios no. about a government and how to rule out neo Nazi. Does Islam mm -hmm. require the violent persecution of Christians? Following this, you talked. You're the one who topic. talked about blasphemy. This is blasphemy, according to secularism. It is blasphemy. Because the Quran talks it is about blasphemy. blasphemy. Yeah, no, it no, is no, and, that's the topic of the then, debate. Then you can't. You oh, can't look, it, you're interrupting. Not, no, 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 I let you talk. I let you talk. I let you talk. You, you just don't interrupt, David. Don't interrupt. Okay. Don't interrupt. Let me point out the inconsistency so you can understand not, it and the audience the and the audience can understand it. You started out by saying that you wouldn't want to ban any kind of people based on their beliefs. So presumably you're OK Didn't with Muslims, that. with Hindus, with uh, Satan worshippers, even in, in government. You want everyone to have a fair, equal shot at being uh, in, in government. Then I asked you about KKK and neo-Nazis and white supremacists. And you said, no, 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 we should, we should have limits on those kinds of beliefs. So that means you're, you have more of an allegiance to secular liberal uh, ideas about blasphemy and what is out of bounds than you do of Christianity itself, than Christian norms and Christian values itself. That's the contradiction in your perspective. Uh, you keep saying I said things that I didn't say. Uh, in fact, I, I mean, I said very clearly earlier um, that if, if every other system in the world called for violent persecution against Christians, it would not change the fact that Islam calls for the violent persecution of Christians. So... But there's no win to that it, argument. It, 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 I, I, don't, I, I thought, I mean, I really thought you had a philosophical that's like, background. That's like, be... that's like saying it, Muslims are bad because they, you know, eat living things. You... It'd be stupid because everyone has to who eat asked, living things. You're the one who asked for the topic. Does Islam require the violent persecution of Christians? I said yes. It sounds like you're saying yes, but, but saying no if we tweak the definition of what persecution is. But you're saying, well, everyone, everyone calls for the violent persecution of, of everything else. Therefore... No, I said uh, discrimination. Therefore, 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 Islam doesn't. That, you, I said discrimination, not, and you were if, you weren't you able to, to if, give me. If you want to you're say not you able to give me. You're not able. You're not able to give me a single example of number one. I asked you for Christians who haven't tried to do dominate Muslims. Give me one example of that ever in history. You're not able to do that. I'm not number trying two, to. I'm not, I'm not trying to dominate you. No, but in history, prior to modernity, because now you are, you're not in power. Christians are not in power. So I ask, for, when Christians are in power, give me an example where they haven't tried to dominate Muslims. Uh, I mean, when, when Christians dominated Europe and America, they could have subjugated the entire world and kept it. Um, yeah, they, they I mean, were I mean, trying we, to do we that. Could, they, we could, we could, when, there, there, there just enough, listen to yourself, enough, David. When, there, there are, when, there are when Europeans, Christians right when Christians to took over South America, oh, when yeah, Christians took over North America. Uh, David, a chance to respond there. Um, no, you're missing the point. Right, right now, right now, Christians, Christians have enough. I mean, there are 2 billion Christians. We make up a third of the world, world's population. And we have some of the most powerful countries that the world has, has ever seen. I, I don't see a lot of Christians saying, hey, we need to go around. Christians and, are not in power today. Christ, liberal atheists, liberal atheists are in power, not Christians. Christians are being jailed for citing the Bible. Christians are being called domestic terrorists when they go to their local schools and they demand that their children aren't taught Satanism. That's what that's the reality of Christians. Are, I'm surprised that you're trying to defend modern liberal secularism. It's shocking to not me. Not what I'm trying. Not what I'm trying to defend. I'm saying I don't know any Christ. I know a lot of. Let, let me put the, let me put it this way. I know a lot of Christians. I don't know any Christians who say, "Hey, let's go out and subjugate." They're not in power. Uh, let's go out and subjugate the Middle East. They're not in power. So. The, the, <laughs> Muslims Muslims aren't in power. You guys are still talking about going around and subjugating the world. I acknowledge that. I acknowledge. Yeah, that. I know. I know. I, I know. And, we're and honest. That's, what, that's, that's the what honesty. I, that's the that's honesty of I'm Islam. Saying. Yeah, and, and that, that's actually an important uh, distinction that you made just, just there. So even when you're not in power, there's still this plot to go around and subjugate the world. It's not a plot. Uh, Christians are doing what you're, what you're saying is, what you're saying is, hey, anyone who gets into a position of power 
tries to maintain that power, so especially groups that have been marginalized and discriminated against in the past. As soon as they get into a position where they can take power, uh, they try to preserve it so that they're not in that situation anymore. I agree with that completely. There's nothing about there's nothing about most other ideologies and most other religions where it's built in there that, hey, there's this goal of subjugating the world and, and persecuting everyone and subjugating everyone and, and forcing them to obey the world. You can say human beings do that. In fact, human beings will do that even if their ideology or religion says that that's bad. They'll still do it. There's just this natural tendency to do it. You say you're honest about it because it's actually part of your religion. So it's not really a choice. It's part of your religion, other, too. It, it's not built into my religion, dude. Yes, you. you, <laughs> you it is. About? Do you have a moral objection? Sometimes God just wants believers to engage in expansionist war. You conceded that in our previous debate. There, you there you misrepresent what I said too. Sometimes, okay, this is the statement. Sometimes God, sometimes God just wants believers to engage in expansionist war. Sometimes in human history, maybe not now, but at certain points in history, God has wanted believers to engage in expansionist. war war that's true right jesus wanted that at some point yeah as um, as testified to in the bible yes or no concede uh, it I, I, say I it thought, i thought i made this entirely clear say it david save it no because it, it, no because it's misrepresented you're misrepresenting everything i'm saying the bible right now. sometimes said, god said, no, wants listen, believers listen, 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 to listen, listen, engage listen, in expansionist listen, listen, wars listen. that's what the bible says you mean sometimes now no so listen. not now i didn't say now okay sometimes let in the explain. past let, let me explain because I thought this I thought this was totally clear, even though it's completely irrelevant to this debate. In Christianity, we've been commanded to love everyone, to honor all people. That's what we that's what we've been commanded. You, you honor them out, by subjugating you would, them. You would point out, no, that's what we're told. We're not I, we're not honoring them by subjugating. Now you're doing what you did with the definition of uh, persecution. Well, it's it's still just you, you to love them, them by so killing not, them. You love them by killing them. No, <laughs> look, that's we, what Augustine argued. We are not. We are not. Uh, we are not in a position to uh, to say that sort of thing. Um, if we're told, Augustine to, said it. If we are told to live in peace with all people, and you say, "Well, to live in peace is to murder them all." The great. Thank you for sharing your Islamic views. Is it? Um, isn't is the world going to be the most not, peaceful? Well, isn't the world going to, going to we be? We have to go into two minute segments if we can't stop the interrupting. I do want to yeah. give David just a little bit more time. Sure. Okay. okay. Sorry. Sorry. Apologies. So when you're talking about the Old Testament, I'm pointing out that is not in a previous debate. I pointed out that what you had there, very different from a situation that we're in today, you have God actually there, pillar of cloud, pillar of fire, fills the temple, performing ongoing miracles, no disease, um, no miscarriages, they're ongoing miracles, and you have the visible presence of God. Any sin against God in that situation is not just a random sin, it's 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 you're flying in the face of God. You're saying, hey, I know what you require and I know you're the true God and there's no disputing this. And I've agreed to follow these rules because I didn't have to, because I didn't have to agree. I could have walked away. Uh, I've agreed to follow this and therefore there are there are harsh penalties and that's associated and that entire covenant is associated with a land. I you, you're asking me, does God have the right to do that? Yes, I, I would say that God has a right to do that. Okay. Then but to God, say, to, but you said, but you God said, God just I, wants believers you, to, sometimes God will want believers to engage in expansionist war. You just said, yes, that's not, no, look, God could subjugate the entire world for, as far as I'm concerned. If God wanted to okay, come down great. here and, and take so that's, over the that's world, morally valid. that's not my objection. That's morally valid. That's, that's morally not valid. my objection to Islam. First of all, yeah, the question, we know. Your, the your objection is, to Islam is that Islam is not true. Yeah, we know that. Like yeah. what kind of. But the thing that you do in your videos and in these debates is that you want to portray Islam as unjust. You want to portray Islam as somehow violating a moral code and doing something that's morally objectionable. And therefore, Islam is false because it commands something that's morally objectionable. My response logically to that argument is to say that, no, you do not have a moral objection to expansion or war or violence or subjugation or discrimination or persecution, you do not have a problem with that morally because your own religion has advocated for it. And right now, just two minutes ago, you conceded that sometimes God, yes, he will command 
uh, believers to engage in those types of behaviors. So your argument collapses. Your argument, it has no legs to stand on. That is the whole point that I'm trying to get you to recognize that you're just arguing in a circle. Yeah, you, you're going to fall back on the idea that, oh, well, Muhammad وسلم, wasn't a true prophet. Okay, yeah, that's a separate debate. Okay, but the debate that or the kind of reasoning that you employ is that Islam is false. Why? Because Islam commands its uh, followers to do unjust things, to do things that are contrary to human morality. But that, you can't make that argument. Why? Because according to you, Jesus also commands sometimes people to do exactly this kind of behavior that you're criticizing Islam for. And in fact, Jesus is commanding more than what Islam has required in the past. So you don't have a moral objection. That is the entire point. And getting back to the subject of the debate. Wait, look, can I answer? Can I respond to that real quick before? And then you can go. go, ahead, go, ahead. go on. Okay. So uh, massive straw man of my argument. Um, I've said in the past repeatedly, if I thought that Islam were true, I'd have to be on board with jihad. So it's not Islam is false. It's not Islam is false because it calls for the violent subjugation of the world. My position is not Islam is false because it calls for the violent persecution of Christians. Um, mo the vast majority of the time, if I'm talking about jihad and uh, what Islam commands, it's a response to politicians and journalists and educators and entertainers and lots of Muslim organizations and lots of Muslims, uh, Muslim speakers, Muslim preachers who say Islam is, is religion of peace and tolerance and Islam has nothing to do with any of this. That was the mantra from the time of 9-11 on that Islam is this religion of peace. I'm trying to show over and over again from the Muslim sources that that's not what Islam is. So this is not, so notice that's separate from the issue of Islam being true or, or false. I'm saying it's false to say that Islam doesn't teach these things. Islam does teach these things, right? So that's separate from the issue of saying with the it's, subtext, it's false. With the subtext that look at the cra these crazy barbaric Muslims, are you, are you trying to pretend that that's not the whole subtext of all about, of I mean, your videos? There, there are crazy <laughs> barbaric Muslims. There are crazy because if you're barbaric, honest, you're honest, there, you'd there say, crazy look, barbaric, Islam, does, Islam does teach these things like persecuting the uh -huh. heretic or the blasphemer. Mm -hmm. If you're honest, you'd say, well, guess what? In the Bible, also Jesus has also commanded this in the past. Notice if, if someone that would be the someone, honest thing to do. Listen, that would be listen, the, listen, 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 listen. If someone instead said, of hiding that, it from your listen, audience, I'm, 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 I'm granting what you're saying. If someone were to say the Old Testament never taught such and such and the Old Testament did teach such and such, then it would be perfectly relevant to, to point that out. And you, you could be you could point that out whether you believe in the Old Testament or not, whether you think it's it, it refutes the Old Testament or not. Look at your comment um, section. Look at the people who are commenting on your videos and saying, yeah, look at these crazy Muslims. Look at how barbaric Islam is. Why don't you point to all your thousands and thousands of commenters on your videos and say, hey, hey, guys, calm down. I'm only pointing out, you know, what Islam is about. We have these same exact things in the Bible. Jesus has, is, is cool with all these things, too. There's no real moral objection here, despite my goofy videos. Why don't you say that? There, there, there's, uh, there's obviously a there's obviously a problem. Notice, following what you're saying. So uh, first, first, alcohol is allowed in Islam. Then later on, it's not allowed in Islam. So notice, if, if you were to say, hey, uh, you know, al notice, if you were to say, if you were to say, hey, alcohol is wrong, and I were to say, ah, but it wasn't always, therefore, uh, he's being a hypocrite and you can never say it's wrong because it was yeah it was, if I said if okay I said point. if I said that there is something inherently evil about alcohol and something so that is yeah well in heaven uh, believers uh, the denizens of the paradise in heaven all, all drink wine yeah there's nothing in something inherently evil about drinking there are evil consequences of it it's a consequentialist uh, point and it, it's banned on that reason as in Islam and the Quran bans it. That's the wisdom behind the banning of alcohol. But if I had that kind of ex, uh, response and said that, yeah, it, alcohol is inherently evil. Yeah, that would be a uh, contradiction. But you're strong. Okay, so, so no. So 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 I, I would I would agree. God, God has the right if God wants to. God, I mean, as far as I'm concerned, if God wanted to wipe us all out and say, you know, human beings are just too bad. I'm going to I'm going to wipe everyone out. I would I would think that God has the right to do that. He's the one who created us and sustains us for every moment of our existence. Um, but what you have biblically is you once you progress, so you have uh, you have in the ancient world. So you're talking 1400 BC, very very weird place. Uh, you have you have these rules for a particular 
parcel of land for a certain amount of time. Then That's when fine. you get when you get to the gospel, in other words, the final marching orders of That's Christianity. Fine. In other words, if you, you can read, contextualize you Bible, all you want, contextualize the, I'm all you the, want. the Bible contextualizes itself. The final marching That's orders. Fine. If you read the Bible and say, what am I supposed to do now? I'm supposed to love everyone, to live in peace with with everyone, um, to harm well, no until one, Jesus returns, to do good, to even. Yeah. If, if God when, God, read Revelation. God, God read Revela will judge. Book of God Revelation. Will judge. God will judge. That's He'll the point. Come That's the point. And he'll I do not rule I, with the I iron trust, rod. I trust Jesus to rule. I do not trust human beings to do a good job of it. That's what I'm saying. Uh, the final marching orders of Christianity right now, what are we supposed to do? Live in peace with everyone uh, to the best of our ability. Doesn't always work like that. Uh, love everyone. That's what we're commanded to do. Final marching orders of Islam, whenever you are in a position to do so, violently subjugate the rest of the world and impose uh you know demi status on people and so on and so to act like we're in the we're in the same ballpark it's what you can it say is. what you can say is hey i agree that that god has the right to do certain things but as far as human beings have the having the right to do certain things now i'd say no because we've been commanded to do certain things and so if Islam, god told if, human if Islam, beings in the bible god tells human beings uh, in the past, according to you, to do Hold expansionist war. Daniel, just yeah. to let uh, David finish that thought, and then we'll come right back to you, Daniel. Okay. Oh, um, no, it's... I, I thought he was done with this. Yeah, I, I was, yeah. Daniel can go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, he, he didn't cut me off. I was done. Okay, sorry. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, I'm just a broken record at this point. You can go through all the contextual um, uh, points that you want. No problem. I have no problem with this contextualization. I call it the magic of reinterpretation, actually. You engage a lot of that, David. So no problem. Do, do that all day. But the point is that there is no moral objection that you have to expansionist war, to vimitude, to jizya, to punishing blasphemers, to killing heretics. You have no problem. You have no moral objection in of and of itself to those things. No, you, you can't because Jesus commanded those things in the Bible. You might, not, you might think that, okay, now there's a period of time where it's not applicable. Um, but you have no moral objection to any of those things. So you have you have no you, moral, you can wait, 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 you, you have no moral you have no moral objection to alcohol, right? In and of itself, no. Okay. Because it's something that at certain times can be made permissible by God. Then we we have we're 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 using the term moral uh, very differently here. And matter of fact, let, let let me give you an example from from the Quran. So. I, I thought that you're not supposed to bow down to various things. Um, Allah tells tells everyone to to bow down to Adam, and Satan says Satan says no, and then Satan gets punished for not obeying what Allah commanded. When if you look at it, Satan's saying it's not just rebellion. He's saying, wait a minute, I'm I'm I'm. I'm fire. He's just made of clay and earth. What? Why am I going to be bowing down to him? It's it seems like Satan was actually, from an Islamic perspective, on the right page. Wait a minute, we've got Allah here, and we're not supposed to be bowing down to some mere human, so this must just be a test. And it turns out Allah was saying, no, you, you have to go ahead and do it anyway. So what I'm commanding you right now is what you, what you have to do. Um, if you have the commands that are directed towards me or the commands that are directed towards you, right? The, the, the command to, to go out and fight this group or something, that's not, that's not directed towards me uh, and not directed towards you. Uh, there are commands that are directed towards you that aren't directed towards me. Um, if I have commands that are directed towards me, I would say I have a moral objection to violating those commands. And you say, ah, but there was some other time when in a different place thousands of years ago where there was a different rule. Yeah, I still, it's, it's still required of me to obey the commands that my God commands me as part of the covenant I'm under keeping the commands of a covenant that I have entered into with God, that obviously I have a moral reason to obey those commands. If I don't, then I'm violating a covenant with God. It doesn't get more, more moral than that. What you're talking about is, you know, some hypothetical, uh, hypothetical scenario where I wasn't commanded to do these things or something like that. Is something wrong just 
in and of itself in every conceivable situation. That's not what I'm saying. That's, that's not what your what audience thinks. That's not what I'm. That's, that's what, what your I'm audience saying all and that's what your all of your audience, as evidenced by your all commentators, of all of them think. Yeah, yeah. Uh, at least the ones that I all see cheering for your videos, they they believe that wow, you're showing how Islam is so barbaric because it has these practices and the kind of moral reasoning that they're using in that moment when they're watching your videos and commenting on them is that these are inherently wrong practices and they believe that Christianity or, or Jesus is all about peace you should correct your audience they know no 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 guys Jesus is not all about peace only in this current covenant is he all about peace at all other times he's been about expansionist war violent jihad uh, smiting the unbelievers he's going to actually come back in human form and do that as the book of Revelation says. That should be your message, David Wood. So you, should, you need to be consistent. I've, I've, ta I've talked about that, I mean, dozens of times and dozens, dozens of debates and so on. Um, so I, I've discussed all that repeatedly. Uh, my objection to Islam is that Muhammad is the most obvious false prophet in history. That's my objection to Islam. Uh, but in addition to that, it also calls for the violent subjugation of the entire world. So people need to be aware of it. And As does every system. People who, people who say, people who say it doesn't, people who say it doesn't uh, need to be corrected and refuted. So that's my position in case uh, anyone's not clear on it. Yeah, and when Christianity, God. whenever Christians have had power in their history, regardless of what David Nothing and his, his magic of reinterpretation, they have violently persecuted and subjugated. They have killed the most people in the past 200 years as a religious group, by far, by far, as Christians. So this does have something to do with the debate because given that reality, yeah, Muslims are going to have certain policies that will try to limit the control of Christians in their in the Islamic lands because they don't want to be massacred like these Christians have been doing for the entirety of their history. Allah, That's Allah, actually a very Allah commanded that, that from is it, all is eternity. It the Quran is, it, is the Quran is, it, is eternal. The Quran is, it, is eternal. Isn't, isn't Allah it, commanded the violent persecution of Christians from from all eternity. David, so if there is a group, is, if there is a group that has been wanting to violently uh, kill you and your religion, does it make sense to have policies to kind of limit the control of those individuals in your society? I'll give you a chance to respond, David. But then we do have to go into the closing statements. Well, it, it, it's just, I mean, it's pretty hilarious that Islam expands from Mecca and Medina. Oh, you're across, not answering the question. Uh, uh, so. No, listen, across, because you just you just massively misrepresented Islamic mm -hmm. history. Islam expands across Arabia, expands across northern Africa, up into Europe, up into Spain, uh, and, and coming from the other side as well, both sides of Europe, all along southern Europe, pirate havens and so on, expands eastward all the way until you get into uh, India and China and so on. And to say, oh, you know, it, it, it's just because everyone's a attacking us. Look, dude, you didn't, you, didn't, you didn't expand like that by defense, defending yourself against people. I never evil claimed Christians. that. If I never had, claimed if, that. If Muhammad had stayed a man. You're the one who's claiming, you're the one who's Christians, claiming that Christians, Christians are would, these innocent little lambs. And oh, they're being so, never said they're it. being persecuted by never all these Muslims. Okay, yeah, you're Never complaining said. about Muslim policies, and I'm saying that those policies are actually that's our debate. very reasonable. That's the, that's the topic you suggested. Does Islam require the violent Exactly. I'm, of I'm saying that it's the this, this discrimination actually makes a lot of sense given the violent nature of Christians as demonstrated through history, not the magic of reinterpretation of David. We Hitler. have to kill the apostates mm -hmm. because of the violence of Christianity. We have to stone the heretics, well, John, the heretics, we'll as Moses said. I guess we'll end with that. Uh, let's see the uh, four minute conclusions. We're going to start with, as we started at the start, we'll start with David for the conclusions and then wrap up with a final speech from Daniel before we go into Q&A. Thanks so much, David. I got the clock set for you at four minutes. The floor is all yours. All right. So um, as far as the, the actual parts where we stuck to the topic uh, in this debate, I've shown that Islam does require the violent persecution of Christians, given any reasonable, rational definition of what violent persecution would be. Daniel's uh, initial response was that uh, somehow it's not violent persecution if he regards it as just, but, you know, killing apostates and, and things like that. Um, that's still violent persecution. What you just say is it's it's just we we have to do this, but that's an agreement. So I've shown that Islam does require the violent persecution of Christians. Islam calls for the violent subjugation of the entire world and encourages an obsession with martyrdom. This leads to the violent persecution of Christians. 
Um, I showed that Muslims are commanded to subjugate Christians until Christians no longer say Jesus is Lord. This is directly out of the Quran. This is Surah 9, verses 28 to 33. Every justification and requirement for fighting Christians in that passage has to do with our basic religious beliefs and practices. So if there's a command to fight us until we pay the jizya and feel ourselves subdued, we feel ourselves subjugated and we pay jizya in acknowledgement of our inferiority, um, that's violent persecution, especially when it's, it's all based on us proclaiming that Jesus is Lord, that Jesus is the Son of God. Because we claim that Jesus is the Son of God, we have to be silenced by enforcing uh, dimitude on us. And the pattern is we can either convert, we can uh, relinquish our rights to at least publicly proclaim the gospel, um, or we can be killed. So that's obviously the violent persecution of Christians. If it's, hey, we have to violently subjugate these people to keep them from saying Jesus is Lord. And notice even there, I mean, there are passages of the Quran that, that talk about self-defense. Allah in, the, in this crucial passage does not say, hey, Christians are going to be out to get you. Christians are going are gonna to come after you. Therefore, you need to defend yourselves. What does he say? Hey, they're preaching the gospel. They're preaching that Jesus is Lord. You have to subjugate them and silence them. How are you going to do that? By sending Allah, I mean, by sending Muhammad uh, with the religion of truth to prevail it over all religions. Uh, and I pointed out that uh, Islam requires Muslims to execute apostates who convert to Christianity. Killing someone for converting to Christianity is obviously violent persecution. Now, Daniel seems to agree with most of what I said that's actually relevant to the debate. Um, so it's clear, it's clear that even if he wants to redefine some terms, he, he believes that Islam requires quite a bit of violent persecution against Christians. And so what he's, what he's arguing is, but everyone does this, that Christians have done it, that uh, every ideology you can come up with would do the same thing. Uh, certainly wouldn't do it in the same way. And you can just, I mean, you can ask Christians where they'd like to live. Uh, you can ask Christians in uh, various places in the Middle East. I get messages all the time, David, can you help me get out of this country? So the, 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 proof, is, uh, the proof is in the pudding here. Um, and so what's Daniel's uh, position? It's that everyone is doing it and therefore we don't have the right to complain when Islam does it. But notice, this debate is not a, not even about whether it's right or wrong. It's not about whether it shows Muhammad to be a false prophet or not, whether it shows Islam uh, to be you know, a, a false religion or not. It simply does Islam require the violent persecution of Christians. And I would say, indisputably, it does. Uh, any honest reading of the Muslim sources uh, say that it does. So this debate was over from the opening statements. This debate was over because we really granted the core of the debate. Everything else since then has been off topic uh, smokescreen. Thank you very much for that closing statement, David. And we are going to kick it over to Daniel for his closing as well. How if long is it? How long is the closing? That was four minutes. And same for you, Daniel, four minutes. Yeah. Folks, our guests are linked in the description. Don't forget to check them out. And thanks, Daniel. The floor is all yours. All right. So a couple of points um, for, that David brought up. Um, Islam does not subjugate Christians for teaching their religion. Ahlul Kitab, Ahlul Dhimma, the protected people within the Islamic State are allowed to teach their religion in their churches and their synagogues. They are allowed to raise their children as Christians, as God-fearing Christians. Islam does not prevent Christians within an Islamic nation to teach the Trinity or to teach any of those kinds of beliefs. So this is a misrepresentation from David. If you go to Muslim societies today, you will find Christians that are teaching the Bible, they're teaching the Trinity. And in many of these Muslim societies, the Christians are actually doing very well socially. In Egypt, the richest Egyptian family is actually a construction company family. Um, that are, who are Christian, Coptic Christians. On the issue of blasphemy that David keeps bringing up, all societies punish def uh, defectors and deter deflect, uh, um, uh, defection. 
leaving the group. All societies do this. All religions do this. This is something that is acknowledged morally, again, within the Bible. It is found in Mosaic law. And we see this within the practice of Christians. It's only liberal Christians today who have no power and who have no influence who are preaching this kind of passivism and, oh yeah, it's fine for blasphemy to run wild and how dare Islam have punishments for blasphemy. This is like a really weak and defeated kind of pathetic attitude from Christians to criticize or liberalize Christians to criticize Islam for this. Throughout this debate, David has not answered a single question that I had. Literally, very basic questions that even the Christian audience who are watching this are probably ripping their hair out asking, why isn't David able to, for example, say if he does or does not want neo-Nazis serving in government positions or should those kinds of views be deterred or prevented? He, like such a simple question. He did not, not answer that. He didn't answer the question. Name me one system that doesn't discriminate against religious minorities. Name me one. The secularism that you are preaching, David, without actually calling it secularism, does discriminate and persecute Christians. Ask any Christian, I don't know what, what part of the world you live in, but where I live in, in the South, in the United States, Christians are acutely aware of all of the oppression that it, or, or the tightening of the noose around their necks by the secular liberal state. And, if, and America is not even the best example because America is a little bit delayed in wiping out Christianity. Look at European history, the very beginning of secularism, what that was about, and uh, look at Europe right now. It's the graveyard of Christianity. Why? Because that is what secularism does. It's much worse for Christians than anything that Islam has ever done or could conceive of doing. David has not answered. Explain how uh, secularism is not about discrimination and persecution, and explain, like, uh, tell me, David, do you want Christians to be dominant or dominated? <laughs> like such a simple question David couldn't answer. He gave some kind of weird answer that, oh, human beings are always corrupt. Okay, well, what about all of uh, Christian history? What about all Jesus himself who is supposed to come in human form? Is he going to be corrupt when he, uh, as described in the book of Revelation, is going to come and rule by the rod and rule by the sword? So this whole debate, your strategy has been to uh, d uh, sidetrack the discussion by arbitrarily restricting the topic, okay? The topic, I want to debate deeper issues about the meaning of discrimination being a religious minority. All you did was say, oh, that's irrelevant, that's irrelevant. Things that are very relevant to this debate, you sidestepped, you avoided, you weaseled your, your way out. That was your debate strategy, David. And I think everyone is able to see that, was able to see that. With that, we are going to jump into the Q&A. Thanks so much for your questions, folks. If you happen to have a question, we are going to try to read through these as fast as possible. You can still submit in the live chat. If you tag me with that modern day debate or put in a super chat, we put those in the first. But again, I got to tell you at this point, even folks, we've got so many questions. I don't know if we're going to get to any questions that you put in as of right now. So heads up on that. Just a warning because we do have limited time. Stop scamming man. Thanks for your question. Says, hello, Daniel. There are Christians living in the peninsula. Do you think they need to be removed? There are Christians living in the peninsula, Florida. No, uh, I, I think it's saying because Muhammad, I think the I think the point is, since Muhammad said that he would expel Jews and Christians from the Arabian Peninsula, leaving none but Muslims, I think that that sounds like what it's asking to me. If there are Christians who are living in the Arabian Peninsula, should they be removed? Well, I if that's the question, then there is juristic difference of opinion on whether Ahlul Kitab are able to be uh, living in the Arabian Peninsula. Um, there is actually a difference, a robust difference of opinion on that topic. So some scholars said, yes, they are allowed. Um, the Prophet, peace be upon him, Sallallahu made uh, agreements for different groups, um, Jewish and Christian groups to remain within different parts of Arabia. Other scholars say, no, that that was abrogated. So there's a difference of opinion on the topic. You got it, Dan. Thank you very much for your question. This one coming in from, do appreciate it. Stop scamming, Dan. Strikes again. Says, in your estimation, Daniel, if Caliph Umar did indeed forbid the repairing of churches in Jerusalem, should he have been impeached for it? Uh, so there, so what you're referring to is the Aqd or the pact of Omar that he had with the Christians within Syria, Jerusalem, and so forth. And the exact details of the pact, 
there is a question amongst the scholars of Islam whether all of those points are required when uh, dealing with Ahlul Dhimma, the, with uh, Christians and Jews who are under Muslim control. And most scholars said that no, not every single point within this Aqd is necessary. In fact, the uh, Khalifa, the Caliph, can decide like what exactly, what provisions are required and, and a Caliph might decide, okay, fine, uh, Christians can repair their churches and Jews can repair their synagogues and expand them or or what have you. And others said that, no, you, you know, that's a hard line. So there's a difference of opinion, but I mean, these details, we can, I didn't want the debate to be about these kinds of juristic details. The overall point that you want, that these questions are trying to get at is that, oh, Islam is discriminating against the Christian minority and that's evil. Okay, so we can talk about those details all day. We can talk about the details of jizya all day. There's a lot of details and detailed points that a lot of Muslim apologists or Muslim speakers will point out. But the deeper topic is this question of discrimination, religious freedom, religious persecution. That's what I wanted this debate to focus on. And that kind of uh, discrimination is found in secular modern societies as well to a much greater degree. If you have a problem with the concept of dhimmitude and non-Muslims being dhimmis under the Islamic State, my question to you is, why don't you have a problem with Christians and Jews and Muslims and everyone being dhimmis to essentially liberal, atheists, Satanists, many pedophiles? I wonder how many of your followers, David, recognize that there are a lot of pedophiles out there and they some of them are in power so that's the kind of concern that i wanted to elicit in christian listeners to this debate and of course i invite all christians to islam and i i uh, want to be very reconciliatory to christians while accurately and honestly representing islam and if we can't and if we can't have these Christians become Muslims, then at least let's work together. <laughs> let's work together against this liberal beast, this atheistic force of secularism that is swallowing us all up. Let's work together against Satan, Satanism, the Antichrist. That's what we should be working towards. And, and we can't do that when you have someone like David Wood taking cheap shots and this kind of ugly, insulting attitude towards Islam and Muslims. So coming in from, do appreciate it. Stop scamming man says, in your estimation, Daniel, if a man in a caliphate announces he converted to Christianity when he was still a minor, what should be done to him? If he's a minor, then he's not responsible. I mean, he wouldn't be put in the position of being a caliph. And it really depends on what he insists on as an adult. A after being a minor, uh, he reaches the point of puberty and he insists on being a Christian, then that uh, could be a problem. But actually, honestly, I haven't read this particular <laughs> example in fiqh. You have like a child who decides to become Muslim he's, or a Christian. He's not like, uh, he's not baligh. He's not morally responsible at that point. Um, but then he wants to, he becomes, he hits puberty. What happens to him at that point? That's a very specific mas'ala, like specific issue within fiqh that I haven't really read up fully on. So, but I mean, again, it's not probably not going to be something that's in accordance with liberal secularism and liberal secular sensibilities. This one coming in from the same speaker asks, if Islam speaks of talking rocks and trees, if such were to say they converted from Islam to Christianity in a caliphate, should they be destroyed? Yes, the rocks should be destroyed. And <laughs> You got it. T-Rev, the game, Dev, says, Daniel, you said believe in the revelations of past prophets, even though they've been corrupted, though. Would you trust an email from your bank with important financial instructions if you thought a hacker had tampered with it? I mean, this is a weird argument that David made in the previous debate, and I'm glad that now I get opportunity to fully address this. So if you have this kind of objection to Islam, that Islam claims that the previous books were corrupted, but at the same time, the Quran will refer and the Prophet Muhammad wasallam will refer to the Torah and the Injil. Like this is the objection that David brought up, the questioner just brought up. But look, the same thing, the same exact thing happens in the Bible with Jesus. 
if you go to Jeremiah 8.8, 8, uh, quote, How can you say we are wise for we have the law of the Lord when actually the lying pen of the scribes has handled it falsely? This is what Jesus says. And then in 2 Timothy 3.16-17, all, quote, All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Also, Matthew uh, 23, 1 through 3. Do not think that I, Jesus, have come to abolish the law of the pro or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. I tell you, you the truth until heaven and earth disappear. Not the smallest letter, not the least stroke or a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. So isn't this a contradiction? At, at one point, Jesus is saying that not the smallest letter will disappear but then earlier in Jeremiah, he's saying that, well, actually the pen of the scribes have caused some kind of falsehood or corruption. So this is also a contradiction. If, if we want to do some magic of reinterpretation, David is shaking his head. He's probably ha cooking up a great explanation for how this is not really a con contradiction. Fine, Muslims can do that too. And the clear explanation, easy explanation, is just because you endorse a book doesn't mean you endorse everything in the book. And it doesn't mean that you think every single letter of the book is unimpeachable or uncorruptible. It's a very simple answer to that question. Uh, re, 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 try try reading Jeremiah, uh, Daniel. That, that will become perfectly clear. This one from you to have heck you for you, David says to David Wood. Assuming both were honest in their faith, do you believe that Anne Frank is in hell and the repentant Christian Nazi who killed her is in heaven? Um, I I don't claim to know those kinds of things. Um, I I just to be clear and this keep in mind spent years as a christian philosopher exposed to lots of different ideas and uh, i think in terms of probabilities like this is the main position or this is traditional christianity and here's this other thing and i don't actually know how to uh how to rule that out and so i just end up saying okay until i until i uh until I really study an issue, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna take a stance on that. But th there are there are Christians at, at Christian conferences who um, who say that there may be you know post mortem uh, opportunities for people who uh, either didn't hear the gospel or had a massively distorted view of the gospel. So an example would be that would be given would be like if a Christian slave trader took a slave from Africa and all that um, African slave was exposed to as Christianity was some really weird person who uh, he hears that he hears some version of the gospel from him, but it, it's it's in that sort of context where it's not clear that he would even get an accurate understanding of of what the gospel is. Um, do people in these kinds of various situations uh, have any sort of uh, post-mortem opportunity to um, to accept Jesus or or whatnot? And uh, guys, I'm just not as confident as as most other people in saying, no, this is the situation. I'm not saying it's not the situation. I'm just saying, uh, you know, Calvinism and Arminianism, you won't see me taking a position. Why? I haven't really studied it. And I'm not just going to say, well, this is, you know, these people I like, and therefore I'm going to, I'm going to stick with that. So, uh, I am, uh, and uh, I'll go ahead and I'll go ahead and say very quickly, this part of this is based on like the old Testament. You had the scholars of the law, the scribes and the Pharisees, and then you have the Messiah who comes before them and they reject him because they were confident that they had the right interpretations of lots of scriptures and they didn't have the right interpretation of lots of scriptures to the point and it affected them to the point where even if someone is performing the miracles of the messiah in front of them living the most miraculous life ever they would still reject him because they were they, they were convinced they had the right interpretations of scripture so uh, my takeaway from that has been i mean un unless i'm really sure that this is uh this is foundational christianity and that there's not another reasonable interpretation of it 
that I normally don't take a position on this issue. I just I wanted to explain that in a little bit of detail because uh, you know this is the sort of thing that would get me in, in trouble if you tell Christians, hey, I, you know, maybe maybe after death people who haven't been exposed to the gospel or people who have been given a really messed up version of it and so on, uh, or you know, people who've only been around Christians who persecuted them or something like that, maybe maybe they would be given uh, other opportunities or something like that. Uh, I just don't know, so I'm not taking a position. This one coming uh, in. If the, well, can I respond to that? Yeah, we hey, have hey, if, you got to, if you got to respond, I wanted to respond to everything you said earlier. We do. Oh, okay, okay. Sorry, sorry. So if you guys are able to keep the responses to minimum, we I do want to jump into this next one from Stop Scamming Man says, if a jinn appeared to the world in physical form as Islam says they can and con and converted from Islam to Christianity under a caliph, should it be killed? <laughs> seems like the what? same question. It seems like the same question, the same with question slightly, oh. slightly different ingredients over and over. I don't <laughs> think it's possible to kill jinn. <laughs> This one, I don't think humans can kill Chin. This is coming in from uh, your old buddy, Apostate Prophet, says, Daniel, you talk about social cohesion and happiness. Why do you think executing and depressing apostates and infidels for the happiness of society is a convincing argument? It's cohesion of society. Um, this is a pretty basic fact that people will acknowledge that you need to have a ground of similarity. There has to be certain rules, um, certain things that are sacred that cannot be violated, um, that all agree to um, by threat of punishment uh, in order to maintain a cohesive society. That exists within secular societies as well. There are certain things, and this is acknowledged uh, by secular society and atheists as well, that you have to have certain rules. And this is why I asked David about neo-Nazis and the KKK, anti-LGBT, anti-transgender, questioning the Holocaust, like all of these kinds of boundaries and red lines that, okay, you cannot cross these lines in our secular society because if you do it's going to result in violence it's going to result in disharmony it's going to result in a lack of cohesion those red lines exist within every single secular society and every society that has ever existed if you start allowing people to say and do whatever they want um, and and are and also believe anything that they want then quickly society turns into anarchy and chaos again this is acknowledged by uh, all secular governments and now with the internet the internet has facilitated so much spread of bad ideas ideas that are a threat to secular democracy this is why the united states government has to create a ministry of truth or a disinformation department why because the principle even if you don't agree with everything the biden administration administration does, you, uh, many secular atheists agree that you need to have an, a control on information. Otherwise, you society breaks from the seams. So Islam also acknowledges this, except it draws the red line around a different issue. It's not about being anti whatever L LGBT or anti this or that. It's about blaspheming against God. It's about something that will matter for your afterlife, whether you recognize it or not. This is the wisdom behind prohibiting blasphemy within Islamic society and discouraging uh, apostasy and criminalizing it in order to preserve people's afterlife. So it makes perfect sense in terms of consequentialism, in terms of even what liberal governments are doing, everyone agrees with punishing blasphemers and even sometimes executing blasphemers. Everyone, including you, apostate prophet, including you, and I showed you that in our debate when I embarrassed you in our debate. You can go back and rewind the tape and watch how I answered this question. I just wanted the opportunity to reiterate it, that you, every society punishes and even... Uh, executes uh, blasphemers. So this is another empty argument against Islam. This one coming in from SWGG for you, David, says, do you condemn the U.S. occupation of Iraq, which led to the killing of millions of Muslims? If yes, then why didn't you make a video about it like you do whenever a random Muslim commits a crime? Did they say billions of Muslims? I said millions. Let me okay. uh, go back. Okay, yeah, well, to be clear, uh, principles of just war theory would mean that you, you should 
take every step to avoid something like that. Um, as far as invading, uh, the invasion seemed to be based on a lot of false information. So, I mean, I'm not, I don't control, I don't control the government. I don't know what information they had to go on that we didn't have, uh, that we didn't have access to, but I would not be a fan of that. And yes, I think they should have taken more steps to make sure that uh, a lot of people who died weren't, weren't dying. You got it. Thank you very much for this question. Coming in from Kwani Upstate says he just admitted Muslims and Islam spread religion through compulsion. However, forgot that his faith says there shall be no compulsion in religion. I think that's for you, Daniel. Yeah, I mean, this is David has debates with these kinds of moronic Muslims. I don't even know if they're Muslims. A lot of them, I think, are just agents who are trying to make Muslims look bad. And they bring up this verse, La ikraha fid din from Surah Al Baqarah, there will be no compulsion in religion. And David hammers them, he mocks them, he says, Okay, you're using this verse to say that Islam doesn't have offensive jihad and expansionist war. You're a clown. You're he just clowns them basically and mocks them. But that is the exact type of reinterpretation and weaseling out that David uses in, in my debates with him. So it, it's it's really funny that uh, he would mock Muslims, and I mock those kinds of Muslims too. I mock those Muslims for using one verse, La Ikra Hafiddin, and ignoring all the context, ignoring all the history, ignoring the Sunnah, the Sirah of the Prophet, uh, ignoring the interpretation of thousands of years or, or 1400 years of scholars, and just saying, La Ikra Hafiddin. That's exactly what David Wood does when he says that Christianity is just about uh, peace and, and tolerance because, oh, Jesus, you know, told Peter to lay down his sword in the Garden of Gethsemane. And, and all of the Christian scholars, almost all of them, the vast majority, agree that Christianity uh, has violent expansionism. And that's, this is what Jesus actually wants. This is what God actually wants. And we didn't actually get to this part of the debate, but there were many within the first 300 years of Christianity, Christians who were part of the Roman army and who were actually involved with the Roman expansion of the Roman Empire against heretics and other groups that the Romans wanted to wipe out. Christians had no problem with being part of expansionist wars from the very beginning of their history. But Christians do not want to acknowledge this because it undermines their entire uh, pacifist um, revision of their religion. You got it. Thank you very much for this question. Coming in from Magic Sand says Christians and liberals also endorse violence against Muslims. This whole debate is pointless. Thoughts from either of you? What was that? He said Christians and liberals also endorse violence against Muslims. This whole debate is pointless. I have a feeling it's more for you, it's David um yeah it's it's it, what do you mean endorse violence against muslims you mean like you know muslims who are, who are terrorizing people or uh, I, I don't know what you're saying the, the if someone were to say hey we're going to go kill muslims for being muslims or for converting to islam or something like that i would object to that in the same way i would object to uh islamic laws of apostasy so it, it, it's there's this there seems to be this tendency to say here, Islam has, uh, you know, called for the violent subjugation of the world for 14 centuries. And whenever it's been in a position to subjugate the unbelievers in the name of Allah, it does so. The only times it stops, the only times it stops violently subjugating the world is when someone actually physically stops it with, with an army. And we point this out and, hey, look at what it calls for. Uh, this is not good for the world. It calls for the violent subjugation of the world, calls for killing apostates, calls for um, oppressing Christians and so on. And we say, hey, we don't want to live like that. And then the response is, ah, but look at look at what Western nations do to Muslims. And, uh, you know, you can you can obviously have unjust things that happen but i mean if the if the west really wanted to just wipe out the islamic world it it, it could it's we we don't we don't want to and if they were if people were trying to do it and people were going on a killing spree or killing people for converting to islam or something like that um i think we'd have too many people who object to it here so don't put don't put them in the in the same 
ballpark here. You can't say, ah, Islam promotes killing, but Western nations have killing as well. Yeah, very, very different situations for the for the killing. Well, I had thoughts on this question. Too. Oh my goodness. <laughs> we weren't sure. We weren't I have sure thoughts if this on every... was for you. Or... Oh, okay, okay, all right, go ahead. So just uh, the, exp he's saying liberals and Christians. Yes, liberals and Christians do want to expand their influence. And America, look, you're talking about American empire. America has imposed its will on the entire world. The liberal world has imposed liberalism on the Muslim world. Muslims are dhimmis in the world today. We have, and this is exactly what Islamic expansionism is. It just means Islamic rule ruling all these territories, not necessarily like putting everyone in chains. It's having a world order that is based on Islam. That is what liberals have uh, established throughout the world, a liberal world order. If you do not go by what the liberal world order says, you will be sanctioned, you will be invaded, there will be belligerence against your country, you will be brought to heel. This is exactly the way that the world works. So if this is inevitable, and this is how every nation has been able to operate, and it's not possible to even conceive of an alternative, which David proved because he couldn't give an alternative, then how can you fault Muslims or Islam for that? It's a very simple argument. Let's move forward. This one, T-Rev, the game dev says, the debate question was whether or not Islam requires violence against Christians. Daniel said, quote, yes, but there's other who, others who do it too. By saying yes, Daniel conceded the debate. Congrats to David. If you want to, I know you already addressed this, but if you want to do it again or add anything. Yeah, just adding that the, the actual debate topic, and David can uh, acknowledge this, it was a violent persecution. Persecution, that's the key word, and I did not concede that. Violence, yes, Im implementing the law is violent. Implementing laws are violent in society. So it's not about whether Islam imposes violence uh, Islamic law pro uh, poses violence because yes, obviously, that's what all legal systems are violent. All legal systems require people to submit to the law. Otherwise, you will get caught by the police by force. And if you resist, you can be shot and killed. That is all legal systems. So it's not, the question is not, is Islam violent against Christians or against Jews? It's, is there violent persecution? Meaning an unjust system that is uh, subjugating unjustly a group. That was the question. I did not concede that. This one for David says, Superdor Energy says, how does your position square with the fact that non-Muslim minorities who practice marriage between close relatives have been allowed to do this practice under Muslim majority rule? Wait, what, what was that? Yeah, I'm maybe, not... maybe he's talking about Zoroastrians. Zoroastrians, Persian Zoroastrians had this, um, what's known as mother marriage. <laughs> Like the son could marry his mother in Zoroastrianism. So maybe he's referring to that, that that was actually permitted. That kind of practice was permitted under Islamic law. And the justification given when you go to Ibn al-Qayyim, one of the major scholars of Islam, he said that this practice was allowed by the early caliphs uh, or emirs over Persia because it's such a disgusting practice that there's no one really that's practicing it. And it has no, there's no possibility that this is going to like corrupt the land or lead to vice, like widespread vice. So even though it's disgusting, like we don't need to like go and police that particular behavior. They want to do it on, in closed doors. Uh, we don't really need to go and, you know, punish that. So that this, maybe that's what he's talking about, that particular practice of Zoroastrians. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I don't know exactly what what that's referring to. Might be talking about what Daniel uh, just pointed out. But I mean, again, the the question is whether Islam calls for the violent persecution of Christians. And Daniel has simply redefined what it means to mean something that is unjust according to his definition. As I pointed out, as I pointed out, then the government of China is not violently persecuting Muslims. In fact, no one's no one has violently persecuted Muslims because they would all regard what they're doing as just and beneficial to their society. And really, you could redefine anything like this. You could go and rape a woman. And when they, you get accused of rape, you say, oh, no, I regard as you know, rape as something that, that you don't deserve. But you brought this on yourself, girl. So you could just redefine anything like this. But uh, I mean, any any 
any reasonable definition of what it, what violence means and what persecution means, uh, Islam is going to fit those definitions pretty well. So the answer to the debate, obviously, is is indisputably yes, according to the Muslim sources. This one coming in from Brandon O. Oh, this question for Heike Daniel says, if Islam is good for his people, why is it that Islamic run countries consistently list top 10 worst countries to live as a woman? As a woman? Uh, I'm not familiar with that stat, but the reality uh, I, is... I can explain. I won't, I won't comment on it. I'll just say uh, there, there have been studies. Now, you probably disagree with the organization. So there's like the World Economic Forum and places like that. And they've done studies um as where different countries are assessed based on you know the the level of education of women in a society or job opportunities available to them or parental rights of women you know over their children in cases of divorce do they have rights to divorce um uh age, average age at which people get get married and so on and they rank the countries and in the, the i've seen a couple of different versions of this but it's always like 11 out of 12 of the worst places in the world based on these criteria are Muslim countries and or it'll be like 17 out of 18 or something like that. So I think that's what they're referring to. But I know you're going to probably disagree with the, the organizations and the criteria. Yeah, the criteria. I mean, you can define the criteria however you want and say that, oh, well, uh, we define uh, women's a status in a country by how many fortune 500 ceos they have in their country and then oh look all these muslim countries or african countries or south american countries come out at the bottom i mean this is a kind of a triumphalist liberal way to justify how, why like liberal moder modernity with its feminist project is superior uh, to all other traditional ways of life including christian way ways of life and muslim ways of life so yeah, I, these criteria, when you look at how they define it, it's all just based on liberal feminism. Like, oh, do women have access to abortions? Like how much is their abortion access? Like they do these same kind of um, surveys or rankings when it comes to Christians or, or United States. And they say, oh, look, the, country, the states that have the Christian majorities are the lowest ranking in terms of women's rights and women's whatever. So this is just a liberal secular bias. We should look at happiness. We should look at, um, I mean, this is one criteria is women's happiness. It's not the end all be all because, you know, sometimes women's, ha women's happiness or men's happiness might be lower in service of a larger goal, like serving God or, or living according to God's plan. But just on this basis of, of women's happiness, happiness in Western countries have been plummeting over the past 50 and 60 years. And this has become a kind of a paradox because it seems like women's rights, according to feminism, are increasing. There's more reproductive rights, more abortion, more divorce, more whatever. But women's happiness is actually plummeting. Why is this? It seems like Christian women are happier with their, you know, patriarchal Bible thumping marriages or Catholics where they don't believe in divorce. Their marriages are happier. This is a conundrum for liberals. And as a Muslim, I'll acknowledge that Christian marriages have much better chance of surviving and being healthy and being productive. Uh, than atheist liberal marriages and, and same with Muslim marriages and Muslim women and Muslim ways of life. That's the thing about me. Like I am a supporter of Christian, a Christian dominated society. I think women will be much happier and society will be much better in a Christian society. I would love to live in a truly Christian society if the, and, and acknowledge that I'll be a Muslim vimmi under Christians as opposed to being a Muslim vimmi under these secular liberal atheists that are crushing religion, crushing uh, all believers. So, but I, I'm sorry to say that David does not recognize that and you're, doesn't you're, reciprocate. You're, you're sorry that I don't want to make you my dimmi. <laughs> this one coming compared to atheists, yeah. yeah, I'd rather be your dimmi than an athe than like apus. <laughs> apus this, is dimmi. This one coming in from Gabriel Garcia. They, they're committed. They they uh, said, I Gabriel personally challenge David Wood to a discussion through debate on modern day debate with thy topic being, quote, this is Christianity, true or false, or I say false, David Wood, can we make this happen? I did not understand any of that debate on this is Christianity. I wouldn't understand the topic, so. 
Do me an email, Gabrielle. I gave you my email. Stupid whore energy says, why does Allah put enmity and hostility among Christians in Almeida 514? Seems like an act of war and a violation of free will. And uh, what what's the verse? Like animosity towards Christians? That's what they said. Uh, put enmity and hostility or hatred and hostility among Christians in Almeida 514 among christians like so christians fight with each other sorry i'm i haven't uh, fully memorized yeah you're right. I'm, so i don't know <laughs> i'm new to it as well super core energy let me know if you want to clarify that but this one coming in from Kwani upstate says uh, it, 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 i could just read the verse real quick you um bet. and so and with those who say we are christians we made a covenant but they rejected they neglected a portion of what they were reminded of therefore we excited among them enmity and hatred to the day of resurrection and allah will inform them of what they did uh and so Cheryl Lee what's says, the verse number 514 says so we have caused enmity and hatred among them till the day of resurrection so it looks like allah is saying uh, enmity and he's causing enmity and hatred among christians or something like that yeah so i mean is there something relevant to the debate on that? Like, I think there has been a lot of animosity and hatred amongst Christians. Um, no, I think it's saying why did, it's saying Allah did that. I think that's the that's the objection. It's saying yeah, why so did Allah, is, why did Allah do it? Yeah, so this is something that Allah controls, and this is something that God controls, as specified in the Bible as well. God is also deceiving and. Uh, scheming in the Bible. God is also putting uh, hatred in the hearts in the Bible. We can go and look up the verses as well, but these same things exist. This is not like a actual theological distinction, uh, as far as I can tell, between Islam and Christianity or even Judaism. So coming in from, do appreciate your question as well. For David, SWGG says, David, don't you think that the U.S. wouldn't have have the highest rate of single motherhood in the world if it was ruled by Islam instead. Um, this this is that situation. This is that situation that we see repeatedly. Um, if Islam would prevent some problem in some way, therefore, what would your objection to Islam be? Like if I say, um, oh, you know, I, I, I sprained my finger, it really hurts. And someone says, oh, well, let me, you know, stab you in your face with a rusty screwdriver. That'll make you forget all about, you know, the, the problem with the pinky. Well, that's true. It doesn't mean I want to be stabbed in my face with a, with a screwdriver. I mean, the, the, the idea that, hey, there are these problems and Islam is the solution. I mean, it's almost like, it's, you could pick anything and start picking out problems with it and therefore present some solution that is not actually a solution. So you could you could take the, the medical field and say, look at all the look at all the malpractice and look at all the people dying in hospitals and look at the injustice that the rich people, they get better care and look at all these problems. Therefore, you know what we need is a solution to all these problems that we point out. You know what we need is a solution. Leeches. We need to go back to leeches. And if we go to leeches and we, we were solving all the problems with leeches, then, you know, we just won't have this this problem. And yeah, you could point out problems that that makes sense to point out the problems. But leeches would not would not be the solution. That would be a solution that, that no one wants. Uh, no one wants to have would not improve the situation. So the idea that, hey, in order to lower divorce rates, we should, you know, adopt Islam. You're going to need a better case for for us for Islam than that. This one coming in from, do appreciate your question. T Rev the Game Dev says, Daniel, you said, quote, just pay the tax, unquote. Well, what if Christians refuse to pay? You used hypotheticals of disobedience to justify 434, in parentheses, wife beating, but you're trying to dodge the topic here. Where's the dodge? Are you, you're talking about jizya? Yeah. Pay the tax, pay the jizya. That's part of living as a a non-Muslim in an Islamic government, in an Islamic nation. Uh, same thing within secularism. There's, you can argue whether a jizya is more uh, burdensome as a tax burden or the actual tax burden that exists in all of these secular countries. We just came out of tax season in the United States and it's quite a large amount of your income goes directly to the government. And if you don't pay the government its taxes and get the IRS on your tail, let me tell you, it's not a pleasant experience. And if you try to dodge 
The IRS, the police are going to come after you. Actually, maybe the federal agencies will come after you. And if you refuse um, them arresting you, uh, putting you in jail, uh, seizing your property, putting a lien on all your property, you lose everything that you own. Uh, they are justified in using deadly force to take you in. That's what the secular state does for those who do not pay their taxes is quite bloody. It's quite violent. It's quite coercive. And many people suffer from it and object to it, including many Christians maybe more conservative and Bible based than David, but this is the reality of all systems of government and Christians as well. If they didn't kill you in history, if they didn't subjugate you through death by because you're a heretic or because you're a pagan, uh, they would also tax you and they would ex extract these kinds of tributes from you. And they are continuing the practice of the Roman Emperor and the Roman Empire. And this is why Jesus says in the Bible, render unto Caesar what is Caesar and render unto God what is God. And Paul also praises leaders and say, pay the taxes to them. So in the same light, if Muslims are the rulers, then Paul himself and Jesus himself would say, render unto the Caliph what is the Caliph's. Render the jizya to the Caliph. So I don't see any kind of problem here for Islam. This one coming in from, do appreciate your question. In the nick of time, says Daniel, my Muslim friend donated, it, donated his zakat to a church by cooking food in their soup kitchen for 100 people and serving those hungry people. Is he going to hell for helping Christians? Wait, uh, the question is, I did that? No, no they're saying he said a friend, he said a friend uh, did his zakat by helping uh feed people at a, a christian i guess soup kitchen or something like that right. so is is he in is he in trouble for that according to islam uh people just don't know the rules of zakat so you have to have a certain amount it's only for muslims but you have to have a certain amount of wealth a minimum amount of wealth i think it's like around five to seven k depending on the value of gold it's called the nisab and only if you have savings beyond that amount are you required to pay 2.5% as a Muslim of your wealth? So does working and service count as a cat? Uh, no, unless you're getting paid for that, you're getting paid for the labor that you're doing and then you can pay that those wages. But the work itself, I don't think that that counts as a cat, but maybe someone more knowledgeable in, in the issue could correct me if I'm wrong in the comments. This one coming in from Frodo says, if we all agree it's Islamically valid to launch offensive military battles as soon as you're strong, shouldn't you expect powerful nations of today, such as the U.S. and China, will work to weaken and undermine you? They are working to weaken and undermine. That is the history. Like, this is not a theoretical. This is actually what the strategy that was taken by the colonial powers, by liberal atheist powers, starting from the 18th century, end of 18th century, beginning of 19th century. That's the colonial project. They did recognize that Muslims are powerful, Muslims are dangerous, and that they need to be exterminated. The original plan was to exterminate Muslims. They weren't able to do that, even though they killed millions, genocided millions, uh, supposedly the enlightened race, because they were trying to take over the world. It didn't work out for them, so they figured out a better strategy was to subjugate Muslims and prevent them from organizing, prevent them from teaching their religion, prevent them from teaching the Quran. And by the way, this is the same strategy that they take with Christians. They are trying to uh, de-claw uh, Christians. They have been for the past 200 plus years because they recognize Christians are dangerous. Christians will take over. Christians will fight for their beliefs. Christians have these strong families and these uh, strong uh, marriages and communities that pose a threat to the atheist satanic world that they want to establish so christians are in the same boat as far as uh liberal secularism is concerned uh since, since that was uh since that was kind of kind of general uh i'd like to comment on that as well uh so daniel and i agree um and i don't see how anyone could get around it that islam does call for offensive jihad so that when muslims are in a position to expand and so on that they're supposed to and so the question uh had to do with other other nations and other ideologies and so on being aware of that and then taking steps to prevent being subjugated by islam i just i just wanted to, to add that according to daniel's 
own definitions and what is right and wrong and what is acceptable and so on uh, based on what he said because notice earlier he was saying ah but you know we have to we have to deal with christians in this way because if we don't then the christians uh, would get us and he's acknowledged that all ideologies do this and he doesn't seem to be uh, condemning it some of the time so it looks like it looks like according to daniel's definitions that it would be entirely justified for all non-muslim nations to subjugate Mus muslim nations and it would be justified for China to oppress Uyghurs because they would understand that if given the opportunity in the future, these Muslims would be inclined to take over and try to subjugate them and therefore preemptively should subjugate um, all non-Muslims and should engage in these kinds of things. Uh, I, I, just to be clear, I'm not saying I'm not saying do that. I'm saying according to Daniel's uh, explanations there, it looks like he would have to regard, to be consistent, he would have to regard it as completely moral and consistent and justifiable to subjugate the entire Muslim world to avoid being conquered. No, no, so there's two separate... No, 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 I, I need to respond to this because this is, uh, David introduced some points here. The, the, the point that I'm making in this entire debate is that discrimination as a tool is something that everyone uses. That doesn't mean that all sorts of discrimination are the same. The thing about liberal, atheistic, or even Chinese or communist uh, discrimination is that it's meant to wipe out religion. It's meant to wipe out families and, and it presses this kind of individualism. So that type of discrimination is more pernicious than anything Islam has regarding Ahlul Dhimma and also what Christian Christianity has. And that's why I say that I would prefer discriminate being a minority, a discriminated, persecuted minority under Christians than under communists or under liberal secular atheists. Because there are, we can, uh, we, it's not just pure relativism that, oh, discrimination is discrimination. That's not my point. My point is that, yeah, there can be differences and some forms of discrimination are better and they're objectively more conducive to happiness, both in the, this life and the next life. So that's, that's my uh, point. And then also the discrimination as a tool or even war as a tool, as a tool the idea is that you are using it as a, as a tool but the point is you're spreading goodness islam is here to spread values of goodness that benefits all of humanity and the war is just a tool for doing that the discrimination is a tool for doing that whereas liberals or the chinese when they're spreading their influence they are trying to spread this atheism this godlessness this satanism so it's bad for that reason not because war in and of itself is bad not because violence in and of itself is bad not because discrimination in and of itself is bad so there i can uh, very consistently object to chinese uh, discrimination of muslims uh, liberal secular uh, persecution of muslims i can object to that on a very consistent basis because my argument is that they are spreading godlessness they're spreading evil they're spreading all kinds of satanism and the objection to christians who would uh dominate Muslims, I am saying that, yeah, that's a better form of discrimination, but ultimately I do disagree with the Trinity and that, therefore that's why I disagree with it as the, the Trinity controlling the world is Christian doctrine controlling the world. That's Boy. my objection, not with the discrimination itself. Many questions left. So Joel Siraj says, Daniel needs to understand the difference between physical dispensation and spiritual dispensation. The thing is he knows it was different back then, but he willingly is taking verses out of context we know this no like it's physical it was physically applied according to the bible as commanded by god so there can't be a moral objection to the physical implementation of law and order against the blasphemer against the pagan against the heretic the, and, and this is exactly what augustine actually argues when christians took power this was in the fourth century uh, and augustine is trying to justify well now we're in power we are going to start punishing heretics we're going to start getting involved in these expansionist wars that is justified why because uh, Jesus himself in the New Testament is described in the Gospels as cleansing the temple. And he is using a whip to scourge. He is overturning the tables. He is using force. He, it's not just spiritual. It's bodily. It's something that he is actually uh, doing in the world, uh, not just spiritually. And this is what justifies Christians 
from using coercion in order to establish God's law. This is what Augustine argues, and it becomes a very compelling argument. This becomes the basis of the just war tradition. It wasn't a liberal tradition. And I recommend reading about this in Just War Tradition, a book by um, uh, David Corey, I believe is his name. Uh, and, and he explains how coercion is part and parcel of a correct understanding of the Christian tradition. This one coming in from, do appreciate your question. Slappy says, Matthew 18, 17, quote, and if he will not hear them, tell the church. And if he will not hear the church, let him be to thee as the heathen and publican. The early church teaches freedom of religion is heresy. So I think that's for that's you. That's for David. David. Uh, no, I, I, would, I would say that that's the exact opposite there. Uh, you, you find the, the same principle with the Apostle Paul, but he's talking about people who've committed various sins. The Apostle Paul says, who am I to judge those outside the church? So the point is, you can, um, you can uh, violate moral commands uh, consistently enough to the point where the church says, look, there, there's the door, there's the door. So that would be a kind of like excommunication, like you are no longer part of the fellowship of believers as long as you persist in could be this heresy or, or so on. But that's not uh, it, no one's no one's stifling your freedom there. You're, you're, you're free to you're free to be as heretical you want under that under that. You could say, you know, in a later Muslim, I mean, a later Christian country or something like that, you didn't have that freedom. But saying, hey, there's the door of the church. If you don't want to abide by the rules and teachings of the church, that's not that's not stopping your freedom of speech or your freedom of religion or anything else. It's just saying you're, you don't actually qualify as a as a Christian anymore. And if you don't want to live as a Christian, there's the door. There's the door of the church. So that's what that's saying. That's not that's not helping anyone's case here. This one coming in from do appreciate your question as well. Albert Leon says Jesus never commanded war or demnitude. Why isn't David stopping him from saying that lie? Uh, well, no, because because you have to look at what Daniel's saying. Daniel is saying that Jesus, as you can't actually say Jesus, you can say the the divine Son or the second person of the Trinity or something like this, as the triune God of the Old Testament commanded war in certain situations and so on. And therefore, I can't condemn war in all situations. Well, I, I don't condemn war in all situations. Um, but Daniel would also be saying, and I'm trying not to strong man or anything here, that certain things that we object to in Islam would have parallels in the Old Testament. So why do we object to them in Islam if they have parallels? And he, so he would say that these were ultimately commanded uh, by Jesus before his incarnation. And so uh, we've already been through this, but my point is not that I would reject war in every situation or something like that, or killing in every situation. Um, it's, you see a progression. The, the idea here is, um, you same, same with the Bible or with the Quran. So if the Quran starts with something, Allah says that he can abrogate it and that he'll bring something better than it or like it. If you start off with a situation that is limited in certain ways, it's limited in space, it's limited in time, it's limited in extent, it's limited in various ways, and then you eventually get to this, these are the teachings that you bring to the entire world, it seems like the final marching orders are what are most relevant. And if the final marching orders are significantly different from earlier, uh, earlier revelations, it seems like, okay, there was, there was some important place for those things at one time, but it's not the final marching order. So God, as far as what God wants for the world, uh, you have to go to those final marching orders. But if you, you compare them, then the final marching orders of Christians are, again, um, love, uh, love your neighbor, love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you, live at peace with all people. This doesn't mean that people can't be punished and so on. It's we talked about this in a different debate, but governments have the authority to do this. Um, but in Islam, the, the final marching orders are, it starts off, hey, you know, let's, let's not kill each other over this stuff when Muslims are in the minority. And then once they have the most powerful force in Arabia, then it's violently subjugate the entire world whenever you're able. And the idea that those two things are the same, that those two systems are the same because 
according to Christianity, there was a time and teachings now abrogated, if you will, that called for violence in certain situations, whereas in Islam, the, the violence in situations is for the entire world, for the entire subjugation of the world. To claim that they're in the same ballpark and you can't consistently raise an objection to one, I, I just think it's silly. This one coming in from, do appreciate your question as well. For and again, Rome says, Daniel, can God command an immoral thing? Is God not the authority over what is and isn't moral? Yeah, I mean, this is demand, uh, divine command theory. Like, I agree with that. Like, this is not an objection. Like, what is immoral? It, it's contingent on what God defines to be immoral. I think me and David are agreed with that. I think we can make appeals to what is intuitively right and wrong. And I have that's what you would do in an argument with an atheist, for example. Um, you would argue about, well, what do people historically and, and humans biologically consider to be moral or immoral? That's, you know, that's uh, in a debate with an atheist. But with a Christian, I think me and David don't have any philosophical disagreement here that, yeah, what God does define what is immoral and what is moral. And the, uh, sure, God can change the application or, or the applicability of certain commands at different points in history. Uh, but it, you can't say that something that God permitted at one point in history, but then uh, prohibited at a later point in history, you can't say that, well, that thing is inherently immoral. And I'll give you an example of, of this type of mistaken reasoning uh, that's brought against Muslims. So a lot of Muslims today will say that slavery, Islam actually prohibits slavery. Uh, slavery is no longer allowed to be practiced. And that is the consensus of the scholars. Um, and, you know, that's what that is often brought up by apologists, Muslim apologists and what David calls Dawagandists. Uh, but what Christians will bring up, what atheists will bring up is that, okay, fine, it's not allowed in this day and age, but there was still a point where Islam is okay with slavery, right? And the implication is that slavery is so inherently immoral and wrong that the very fact that at one point it was allowed in Islam is disqualifying, is morally disqualifying of Islam. That is the argument that they make. And this is, it's a, a very sensible argument. And that's why I don't engage in th those kinds of apologetics. Uh, I say, I defend slavery and the practice of slavery. As you can watch videos on my channel, and I explain that this is some, a, 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 a historical universal and there's good reasons to practice it uh, on a rational, reasonable basis. But uh, this is the exact same kind of argumentation that I'm using against uh, David and the Christian apologetics. I'm saying that, look, these practices of expansionist war, at one point, God allowed it. Okay, fine. If you want to say that's not applicable in this day and age or, or after Jesus, uh, there's a new covenant, fine. I I'll concede all of that, uh, of that. But you can't say inherently there's a moral problem with violent expansionism. And so much of David's um, videos and his missionary work, basically, gets mileage off of this kind of unstated assumption that, yeah, uh, violent jihad is inherently immoral. He gets so much mileage out of that because he's taking advantage of the inherent liberalism of his audience. And this is something dishonest. He should be honest with his audience and say, hey guys, as, as he's done in this debate, like when, he's, when you push him and you confront him, he has to concede it. But hey guys, look, uh, this is something that is acknowledged in the Bible. David should recognize that and teach his audience that, yeah, expansionist war, it, God has allowed that at certain points. So it's not inherently immoral. It's not inherently evil or unjust. And as a matter of fact, every group, it, once they get power, they will want to spread their influence. And I asked David if he, if he were the king, would he influence the world by um, uh, you know, having cr Christian Christianity be privileged and having Christian values be privileged? Like, wouldn't that be a sensible thing that every Christian would automatically say, yes, of course, if I had that kind of power, I would want the, the, um, you know, the, the words of God Almighty, Jesus Christ, to be the highest? Wouldn't any Christian acknowledge that? But apparently David is not that type of Christian. He thinks, no, no, no. Neil Nazis we can prevent from being in government, but Christianity, uh, everyone should be equal. We can't prefer Christianity. Holy smokes. Okay. 
Library closes in 19 minutes, as you can hear. Uh, you to have, heck you says, would you say that Daniel has no moral objection to alcohol because God allows it sometimes. So do you have a moral objection to abortion when God has allowed it before? Um, you're talking about a different kind of uh, allowing here. So in Islam, it was at one point, uh, it was one point uh, permissible. You weren't supposed to show up drunk to, to prayers and so on. And then later it was just, it was just generally for forbidden. Um, that's very different from saying that, you know, abortion is allowed in the United States. Do you still oppose abortion? So I, w I would say that, that uh, abortion is wrong. You're, you're, uh, you're, you're stopping the actualization of the image of God in someone. So if, if Daniel actually wanted to know if I were making rules, if I were making rules, and this will, this will get me in trouble with, with, a, with a lot of people, if I were actually making rules and I were king of the world, I would outlaw abortion. So I, we, can, we, can, we can say that. This one coming in from Slappy says, Romans 13, 1 through 14, proves the Catholic truth against religious liberty of false religions. I support you, David, but don't reject Christian tradition. Um, that, I don't know how you're reading this differently as a Catholic, but this is actually, this is not talking about Christian rulers. It could be re referring to a Christian, a Christian ruler, but Romans 13 is about submission to authorities and it's saying authorities um, are are established by God. In other words, governments have authority. Doesn't mean they, they do what's right. It doesn't mean you don't call on them to do what's right, but they have authority to punish wrongdoers. So that's not talking about, I don't know how that's, I mean, the, the authorities, when pa the apostle Paul is talking right there would have been Roman authorities. So he's saying, don't get in, don't disobey the Roman authorities, unless it's something that clearly is just a violation of your, your Christian belief, because Christians did that when they were told, hey, you know, you need to burn these incense to, to Caesar and say Caesar is Lord. That's when they said, no, hey, if you want to come up with rules about not doing this and not doing that, we're fine until it actually uh, is something essential to our faith. But so in Romans 13, the apostle Paul talks about submitting to authorities, authorities having um, power from God. So that that's not that doesn't that's exactly what I believe. In fact, I brought that up, I think, uh, quite a bit in uh, in our last debate, but also here in, in Romans 13 to tie into what I've uh, what I've been saying in this debate, uh, starting in verse eight. Oh, no one anything except to love each other for the one who loves another has fulfilled the law for the commandments. You shall not commit adultery. You should not murder. You should not steal. You should not covet. And any other commandment are summed up in this word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. And it's just interesting because Daniel would regard me saying, hey, that's what I'm commanded. I'm commanded to love people as the fulfillment of the law. And Daniel would say, well, this is the miracle of reinterpretation. I'm just reinterpreting. It's not miracle of reinterpretation to say these are the final marching orders. These are the commands that are directed towards me. Yes, God can. God can have different covenants with people and God can judge the world if he wanted. And God could have made different rules and different commands uh, if, if he'd wanted to. But what I'm actually called to obey are these commands and I'm going to obey them. And whenever I say that, whenever I say, hey, these are the commands that are actually directed towards me, commands that are part of a different covenant, not directed towards me. I'm going with the commands that are directed towards me. The response is it's the miracle of reinterpretation. Well, we are going to read just the, the questions that we absolutely can, folks. So sorry if I don't get to your question. Email me at moderndaydebate at gmail.com if we didn't get to your question. I am sorry about that because I am going to get kicked out of here in about five minutes. I've got to run. This one coming in from T Rub the Game Dev says, Daniel, you're clinging on to violence from the old obsolete covenant to fit your narrative. If you work for a company and they change their policy, would you still abide by the previous policy and ignore the new one? Uh, completely misses the point that I just have repeated and what David said himself right now. Like, yeah, I can see. Okay, fine. According to Christianity, the old covenant is obsolete. Okay, fine. It's obsolete. I can. Let's just concede that. 
but still you have no moral objection to violent expansionism or subjugation or expanding the influence of Christianity. You have no ob objection to that. And by the way, d quoting these verses about loving your enemies and loving your neighbors, you can love people and also force them to follow something that will be beneficial for them. Ch parents do this all the time. Parents will uh, force their children, coerce their children to abide by things that are going to be ultimately beneficial for those children. In the same way, Christian scholars believe that loving uh, humanity and loving your enemies was perfectly consistent with subjugating them, even killing them. You can kill someone that will be better for them. Uh, and that is part of love. This is what Christian scholars have actually uh, argued. And the Islamic view as well is that the expansion of Islam is because of love, is because of mercy for all of mankind. This is a mercy because this is the way of life that is going to best serve humanity in this life and the afterlife. It is also about love. There is no contradiction between uh, violence, war, uh, subjugation, discrimination, and love and mercy. There's no contradiction. So it looks like Actually, Daniel once looks like Daniel once again is making a case for why people should subjugate the Muslim world. Very, very interesting. This last one, Bladvad, thanks to your question, says apostasy law isn't as black and white as Imam Hanbal categorized public and private apostasy in which the latter isn't punished. David, USA has death penalty for treason and espionage. Is it wrong? Uh, it, I mean, it, it depends on what the treason, I mean, I'm not I'm not for the the death penalty in in general nowadays. I don't I don't condemn it for all times because I mean it, it can be you can kind of go either way. I'm just saying if you left it to me and said should this person be put to death, I probably wouldn't put people to death uh, anymore. I'd probably lock them up. But as far I don't make the rules as far as the as far as the governments uh, are concerned. Yeah, you pub punish treason, certain kinds of treason that are that are a a, a danger uh, to your nation. You can. You know, uh, you can uh, impose the death penalty for those kinds of things. You can impose penal death penalty for murder and, and, and all sorts of things. Um, but to draw a parallel, to draw a parallel with Islam on this point really shows the problem. It's, hey, if someone leaves Islam, if someone leaves Islam, we're going to regard that as uh, as treason against the nation and just and just kill them. Right. I mean, you know, treason and in a place like the United States or Western nations is like you're giving secrets to someone who's going to come and attack your nation and and get everyone killed. Uh, that's that's part of the problem with Islam, that they're regarding, you know, leaving Islam and, and converting to another religion as a kind of par like parallel to that. Like it's it's actually in the same ballpark and therefore you'd kill someone for leaving your religion. And so it, it's once again, it's a problem. It's like if you see any problem in Islam, well, don't they have this somewhere else? Uh, yeah, they do have, you know, killing people for treason and so on has nothing to do, I'd say, with persecuting Christians and killing apostates and so on. Thank you. You got it. Thank you very much. And then this last one. Appreciate your question. Muslim Boogeyman says, David, you mentioned something about virgin factories. What do you think about the Christian alternative of the toddler cherub factories? no idea what a toddler cherub factory is i get maybe in certain paintings and <laughs> certain like uh in certain renaissance painting they paint little little cherubs or something i don't i have no idea what this what this is referring to cherubs are not like babies um according to christianity <laughs> they were like that in in uh in in paintings but that is not actually christianity virgin factories you, you wouldn't call it a virgin factory but that is actually part of islam you do get your your virgins in paradise you get to spend eternity deflowering them. So not a, not a good parallel. This one coming in from Muj Khan says, George Bush called the war in Iraq a crusade. Read American Sniper. It was seen as a Christian war. Don't deny this, David. Um, I didn't see it as any kind of uh, Christian war. Uh, and I couldn't conceivably care less what George Bush said about it. No, but you don't, you don't need to go to George Bush. You can go to tons of people down through history thinking, you know, we are waging war in the name of Jesus, uh, I'm not talking about that. I'm not talking about that. And Pat, in fact, that, that's, that's part of, that's part of the issue between me and Daniel. Da David, what, why wouldn't you want to control people? I'm, I'm basically looking for at thousands of years of human history and saying human beings always screw up. So you need to come up with the, the principles and policies that are 
are least likely to keep people from screwing up and horribly oppressing each other. That's hard to do because as Daniel's it's called Islam. It, he's he's he's, called he's Islam. right. Daniel's right in a lot of what he says about humans just naturally. Hey, here's my ideology. As soon as I got power, I have to go in over and uh, and uh, and conquer everyone else. Uh, but I just I'm very suspicious of when people that's, um, that's get why. that kind of power. And so it's irrelevant that's, to me to say, well, George Bush thought this, and American sniper said this. They can say anything. They can say anything they want. It doesn't mean that is actually a Christian teaching to go to Iraq and and fight. You could say what you what you could say is, you know, was it a just was it a just war? Certainly some elements I would regard as definitely not just. I don't I, I'm not an expert in the topic, but the discussion is whether whether it's it's a it's it's a just war or not, whether it's I don't it's not a it's not a Christian war. I don't know what you're talking about. David is perpetually wondering, oh, life is so terrible. If only we had a system. And Christians are like, it's Christianity. It it's Christian Christianity is the system sent by God. And David's like, I wonder what system could there be? This one from debate, don't oppress. Thanks so much for your question. Says Daniel, you seem to mix faith and politics. Should laws not be based on reason rather than a faith or religious belief? Laws are based on morality. What is morally good? What is morally bad? That's what laws and politics are based on. And that is defined by revelation and what God sends. So you cannot separate politics and law on the one hand and morality on the other hand. This is why the whole concept of separation of church and state is incoherent on its basis. Laws in secular countries are preferring the morality of atheists and sometimes even Satanists, increasingly so. That's what the secular system does. It prefers that, that morality, those definitions of good and evil, where it's good for women to rip out their children in abortions and evil to prevent women from murdering their children. That's the definition, that's the morality that the laws within these secular countries are based on. You're not going to ever be able to separate uh, morality from legality and politics. And Islam is honest because it recognizes that and it advocates for law that is based on true morality, true goodness, and true evil. And that is what the Sharia is. That's what Islamic law is. The fact that Christians don't recognize this is why, part of the reason why they're being dominated intellectually, spiritually, and morally, and bodily by the secular juggernaut that is wiping them off of the face of the earth. Got to run, but I want to say, folks, our guests are linked in the description. Highly encourage you to check out their links and hit that subscribe button right now if you haven't already, as we have many more juicy debates coming up. In fact, tonight we're going to have a very controversial debate. Roe versus Wade on trial. Richard Spencer and Kay Fellows will be debating. You don't want to miss that one, as well as many other juicy ones coming up. So hit hey, subscribe. Tell Richard Spencer to debate me. Really? Wait, wait, or Robert Spencer. Okay, Robert, Robert Richard. Spencer. Yeah, Richard Spencer's a, a white nationalist. <laughs> oh, I'll debate him too. Bring it on. Yeah. I'll ask him. Want to say thank you very much, David and Daniel. It's been a true pleasure. Thank you so much, James. Thank you, David. Mm -hmm. And folks, I won't be able to stick around for an after show because I'm at the public library. They're closing in a minute. And so I will be moderating tonight's debate, though. I found a stream spot. So go there tonight, and I will be hanging out in the after show for that one. I'm excited to get to catch up with you all, and thanks for your support, folks. So we'll see you tonight for that big debate. You don't want to miss it. Thank you. Thanks, guys.